Damn, chat, you're looking cute today. How are you doing? Ah, blah, 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 blah. You know? You know how it goes. All right. Let's see what we're going to do today. Oh, Cash Override, how are you doing? Gibble Wibble, how are you doing today? Gibble Wibble, is that, is that from Pokemon? I remember farming Gibbles. I remember just making a shit ton of Gibbles because I was trying to get the right IVs and EVs. Doing good, fam. How are you doing? I, I'm doing okay. I didn't really sleep last night. It was a little bit rough. But we're, we'll, we'll make this work. We'll make this work. All right. Ooh, reading the info security header. Oh, there we go. Bad dreams? No, I just couldn't sleep. That's pretty standard. Ooh, look at that. A little Nessie right there. Actually, not really. Is this stream going to be uploaded to YouTube? Uh, yeah, the last one I just did, I just uploaded. I'm waiting for that to process. And then this one will, will be the same, uh, unless we just go on rants today. You, you never know, sometimes uh, sometimes the stream just turns into, uh, you know, a shit show. <laughs> sometimes it's just not worth archiving. <laughs> but I think today will be a pretty fun, uh, pretty fun, exciting day here. So we'll see how that goes. Hmm... I don't know why I keep reading Reddit like there's anything that's going to show up that's going to be good today. I really just need to find some music and we can start the stream. Hmm. Man, picking music is, is so tough. Uh, maybe, I, maybe today is a Pandora day. Where I could try out a little bit of, a, a little bit of you know, exploration. I feel like Pandora's a little bit better for exploration. All right, let's see how this goes. All right, so today we're gonna talk about all the advanced parts of fuzzing, and by advanced, I mean honestly things that aren't too difficult. Um, we're gonna talk about why uh, taint tracking is so important and why you need taint tracking over just uh, bite, uh, like, I don't know, read bite tracking or whatever. We're going we're gonna to do some things that I don't think AFL does. Uh, no insult to AFL because AFL doesn't have the ability to do infinite breakpoints like we do. But I could be wrong. I know AFL has an effector map, and that's very close to what we're going to be doing today. But if I'm not mistaken, AFL's effector map tries to associate different branches with the uh, input. Um, and basically, I don't think it can do it until a condition has been observed to change. Which means that if there's a really tough branch to, uh, air quote, solve, uh, I think AFL will, will struggle to fill that in the effector map. But I could be wrong on that. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But we're going to start off by writing an application that we know that our fuzzer can find bugs in. And let's go write it right now. So we'll make make dir test program. Um, we'll make this uh, test.c int main void. And we're able to do this because we're using our fuzzer. So we'll just say uh, fuzz me unsigned char buff size t len and this will call mm, char buff is malik let's do uh let's let's go a little bit extreme it's not that extreme it's a pretty small input but we'll call fuzz me on buff and we'll give it the length of the buffer very advanced right here um Technically, we should return zero here. So we're going to call fuzz me. And then once we hit fuzz me, we will uh, we'll say if buff 47 is equal to OX20 and buff 
900, that number is equal to OX11 and buff. Uh, I think that's out of bounds. One 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 one. That should be in bounds. It's equal to OX twenty nine. Then we will uh, built in trap. So we unfortunately will not be able to find this bug. Well, we we will, but it'll take a a doozy of a time. And let's talk about why. So we'll build a make file here, and we'll make sure we build this uh, opt. RV64, I bin this GCC. Something like that will get us in the ballpark of what we want to do. And uh, disable optimizations, turn on debug info, and I think test.c is the name of the program. Okay, we have no size dot size uh, t. Include standard lib dot h. All right. So there is our program, obviously. We're not able to fuzz it right now because we're not calling it in our fuzzer, and we'll just copy this over to here. Uh, test program, eight out, out uh, fuzz me. We'll call it fuzz me. And luckily, this uses the exact same syntax. So all we're going to do is we're going to put a breakpoint at fuzz me. And we should be able to change this to load elf fuzz me. And we should be up and running and fuzzing. OK, 864. Uh, no calic. That makes sense. There's just there's, there's no calic in this uh, program. We could make all of these things. Yeah, we're probably not going to have a realloc either. But not a big deal. Huh, we don't have a free either. Well, that makes sense. We never call free. Oh, wait, that was something else. Um, ah, yes. We will say remove breakpoints, fuzz me. I don't know if I need to remove the breakpoint. I don't think I have to, but whatever. So anyways, we'll compile a cache. Um, and there we go. So we're fuzzing it, and we're fuzzing millions of times a second. Uh, and let's make sure our input size is correct. Uh, resize. Oh, we're actually using the TIFF corpus, which ain't great. So we will create um, DDIF is dev zero, OF is inputs foo, block size is 1024, count is 128. Right, so that's the size of the input buffer, and we should end up writing that in. We make sure that the fuzz input length is less than or equal to the length, and then we uh, update the length and all of those things based on the fuzz case. So it looks like we got one of the bytes, two of the bytes, and the next one is likely going to be the crash. But the next one's also the hardest one. And there it is. Oh, wait. Yeah, there it is. So we were able to hit our crash. Fantastic. But that took us three, yeah, uh, somewhere, somewhere in the range of like four million fuzz cases to find this bug, which is a very, very, very trivial bug. And the question is, why did that take so long? And ultimately, it comes down to our mutator. Our mutator corrupts. We have two different mutators, one that corrupts. Uh, we pick evenly between them. One of them corrupts up to 512 bytes, and one of them corrupts up to 8 bytes. And to hit this bug, we need to corrupt uh, the correct offset. And correct corrupting the correct offset is very unlikely. So in the case of this, so that does uh, 256 on average, and then this one does 4 bytes on average, because you have the, the thing that you're uh, randing. If we... Add those together and divide them by two. That means we corrupt on average 130 bytes per fuzz case. And the size of the input is 128 uh, kilobytes. So if we do 130 times 131, uh, that's the odds that we pick the correct index. Um, or 131, or 130 divided by 131,000 will give us, we have a. Uh, <laughs> Nine times ten to the negative four chance of 
picking the correct correct byte. And then if we multiply that by or the correct offset. And then if we multiply that by 1 over 256, which is the odds that we fill in the correct byte there, that gives us a 1 divided by that, a 1 in 260,000 fuzz case chance of filling in just one of the bytes. And we have to do that three times. So if we multiply that by three, because we have coverage guided fuzzing, that's about 800,000 fuzz cases to find that bug. And it took us about 4 million, so we're within a factor of four, which is pretty reasonable. I bet with different runs, we'll likely see different results, right? In this case, there it is. There it is at uh, 125, or 1.25 million fuzz cases. And our theoretical, sorry, and yes, I can remove starting soon, um, our theoretical is about 800,000, and it's a little bit less than that. So 800,000 fuzz cases, and we're seeing, yeah, somewhere in that ballpark, right? Plus or minus a factor of 5 or 10 for the variance that we have here. Now, that's a really big problem. And so what we're going to talk about is how to determine which bytes are actually being used. Now, since we use an emulator, this is actually really easy. So I'll show you what we can do. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to modify our MMU. And we luckily have some bits. We have some extra bits here. We have four extra bits that we can store in here. And we're going to say um, uh, it sucks that read and read <laughs> is the present and past tense. So um, this will be the accessed bit. Um, set when the byte is read, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make it so when we read a byte, we set this access bit, which will tell us which bytes were actually accessed by the program under test. And this will allow us to know exactly where in the input uh, is being used or being consumed by the program. It is impossible, it is impossible to affect the program with a byte that isn't read by the program. Thus, it's very unlikely that you gain anything by mutating, well, you gain nothing. It's, it's provably impossible that you gain anything by mutating a byte that isn't something that is accessed by the fuzz case. Now, obviously, if you if you modify multiple bytes, it's possible that the first byte that you modify then makes a byte that you haven't seen yet be accessed. But in that situation, you'll just wait for the next fuzz case to pick up and build on that information. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through our memory manager and we're going to make it so anytime you read a byte, for every single byte, it will track which bytes were actually read. And since we keep our fuzz input in one location, it makes it very easy we will be able to just, when we save an input, we will save the uh, this packed bitmap of what bytes were actually used during the fuzz case of that input. And then that will tell us exactly which bytes we should bother mutating in the first place. So, now, there's going to be some flaws with this, and we'll get to that in a little bit after we implement it, but people can probably start piecing together where this could fail and where this could really struggle to actually do anything of meaning, but in a lot of situations it will get you at least something and it's so easy to do. So we'll go to where we set, uh, check the perm read bit and um, set permission, set dirty len, okay. We wanna do, I think read into is the core of everything. We also have a peak, hmm. So read into perms, that goes into read into perms, that does as well. That goes to read perms, it goes into read into. I'm just making sure everything ends up flowing into here. I think peak is the only one where that doesn't happen because that will get you a mutable slice. And in the case that it's writable, it'll update those bits and uh, we'll have to do this in two spots. But in read into perms, we'll first check the permissions, then we'll copy the memory. Then after the memory has been copied, thus read, we will mark, um, we do have a slice of the perms, which is fantastic. So we'll just do perms.intermute, and we don't need an index. Uh, perm, we can do perm.0 or equals perm accessed. So this will indicate 
that this memory has been accessed. Um, and in this situation, I think, uh, ooh, get mute. I see. So this is now going to require mutability, which kind of sucks. That's going to propagate to all these other ones, but that's fine. Um, we now can potentially set information, or we can modify things about the MMU when we do this. Now, we also have to fix uh, one other thing here, which is um, we have to update the dirty bits. So whenever we set those permissions, we will have to update those dirty bits. So let's go find that. Um, adder zero buff dot len. So basically this logic, and I probably should turn this into a function, but we'll say update dirty bit blocks, um, because now reading memory will dirty it, which kind of sucks, but we can make all of this disableable, uh, through yeah, we can make it possible to disable all of this stuff via um, uh, just a, a config flag or something. So if uh, we, we will compute the dirty block bits, we will go and set the dirty bitmap and update the dirty map, and then we'll indicate that this memory has been accessed by setting the access bit for all of the things in the permission range. Um, and that should be good. Go through address dot zero, divide by the size, that divided by size, dot dot equals to block dot end, and then update all of the dirty bitmap. Okay, now we also have to do that here. So this is gonna check the permissions, and I think for peak, we have to do the exact same thing, indicate the memory has been accessed. Um, hmm. I only want to do this on read, so luckily this is a read only, and then um, uh, let's go find where we define that bit. We'll say this is the accessed bit, set when a byte is read, but not when it is written or executed. Because we actually don't want to set the accessed bit when we write to a byte, because we don't care about that. If it gets overwritten, that's not what we're looking to trace here. So uh, here, indicate that the memory has been accessed, compute the dirty blocks, and then we'll do the same thing here. Um, oh, I already copied that into peak. So peak now will, what's going on here? I have too many copies of this. Peak, and then we'll say if, Um, oh yeah, this needs to be updating dirty bits in the has raw situation as well, which we're currently not doing. Um, unless that was intentional, but I don't think it was. So I'm going to say, uh, if raw, oops, if has raw or, so if any of the bytes has raw, then we're going to update which things have been dirtied. Um, unless I just want to update these things in the bitmap when I flip them, which honestly probably makes a little bit more sense. Um, here, I'm going to do this. Pub fn update dirty. Ah, it doesn't need to be pub. Mute self adder vert adder. Uh, updates the dirty map indicating that the byte at address has been dirtied. Well, this is going to maybe hurt perf, but we only, hmm, this will hurt our speed in reading and writing memory, but it will help our reset speeds, and I think reset speeds are more important, so we'll do this, yeah. So, the block will take the address, let block is equal to the address divided by the dirty block size. So we determine the bitmap position of the dirty block, and then if it is not set in the dirty bitmap, then we push it to the dirty list. So any place that we update permissions or do any of this stuff, and now we get rid of all this shit, 
um, except for the access, which we will add. Here we will say um, update. Now we need an ii. Self.update dirty virtual address. This will be the address.0 plus the offset. Um, so set that. OK, and this wasn't mutable before, so we don't need to worry about anything except for this situation. And then here, same thing. If it has raw, then iter mute, oops, dot enumerate, go through all of these. If we propagate the raw bits, and thus we modify that memory, we will want to update dirty. And then, do I not update dirty at all for this? Check the permissions. Um, go through each of the bytes. Hmm. Actually, I feel like there's a bug here. So let me take a look, make sure that everything looks sane in all these others. The, the bug's not that big of a deal because we don't really use the map often. But here we go through has raw, go through all these things, determine the permissions, copy it into memory, compute the dirty bit blocks, propagate raw. Right. That's great. Then this just updates the dirty bitmap. And then this one, we want to, uh, I think, um, hmm, check if we're getting right access. And if we're getting right access, only propagate raw. Yeah, we can get rid of this has raw. We'll just get rid of that. That was an optimization, but we don't really need it. Um, update dirty bits. So we'll say, if we're trying to get right access, then propagate raw, update dirty bits. And we'll do self.update dirty, this. So we're indicating that this memory may be modified. In this case, we don't know for sure because we're giving a meetable slice. But if we are requesting right access, then we update the dirty bits, um, propagate the raw bits here. And how does that behave? If perm raw, if the actual permissions has the raw bit, then set the read bit. OK. And then uh, check if we're accessing memory. And then if we are doing that, if the expected perms our perm read, then we want to uh, indicate the memory has been accessed. So if, first we check permissions. So if the permissions don't match, we immediately fail. And then that makes sure we don't modify anything on, we don't set anything until we actually have validated permissions. And then we update the dirty bits if uh, if writing is requested, then we propagate the raw bit, and then we set dirty bits. And if the memory has been accessed, um, or if the memory is being accessed for read, set the access bit for the permission, and then update the dirty bit, because we've changed that permission. And now, read into perms. This should do the same thing. Go through all of the perms. If uh, we know that we're reading it in this case, so set accessed. Um, and set update dirty. Okay. And we'll just say, uh, but not when it, when, not when it is written. Executed will actually count. Okay. So now we should have a way of tracking, uh, hmm. Hmm. Yes, because we have access to perms. Well, that's annoying. Um. I 
And I don't know if I can do a macro rules in a convenient way. That is a little bit annoying. This is a common pattern that you see in Rust that can get a little bit frustrating when you want to call a helper function and the compiler is not smart enough to know that this doesn't access anything inside of uh, this doesn't access anything that we currently have, which is permissions. Um, wonder how hard it would be to add that to the compiler. That would be so nice to have. Um, what could I do here? I mean, I could put the dirty bits in a structure. And basically, if I have the dirty state and I put it in a structure, I can call that on the dirty stuff. So we'll just do uh, pubstruct dirty state. And this will track um, tracks the state of dirty memory. OK, dirty state. And this will be a dirty state. Uh, dirty memory information. OK. And this will be a dirty state is a dirty state with those fields. And that should be good. I'll put this at the end just so things line up a little bit better. And we'll align that. Actually, we don't need to. OK. And then we have to do the same thing here. Dirty states, tab that in. Bink, 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 bink. OK. So this should be identical, but obviously there's no self.dirty. Dirty states. Dirty states. Oops. Dirty states. Dirty states. Okay. Set dirty one. Yep. We have to be able to do that. And dirty states. What is this on? Right from? Okay. All right. So then update dirty. I think that's the only one we have to update. So this we will now move to dirty states. Impl dirty state, paste, update dirty, and that should work. Update dirty, not found on that. Good. Now the compiler can be smart. And reason that these are separate fields being accessed. OK, and now this should build, and it will kind of work. Uh, let's make sure we'll run this in one on one thread, and then we'll switch over to the emulator by disabling the JIT, and we'll just do that. OK, so since we're using the emulator, in the pure emulated mode, we should be able to track these sorts of things. Uh, update the dirty bits. If we're reading, set its access. Read into perms for all of the perms. Set that it's accessed and update the dirty bits, which is exactly what we want. Now, resets are going to get a little bit more expensive, but they weren't really that slow anyway, so it's not that big of a deal. So now what we can do is when we get to the end of a fuzz case, I'm just going to do um, fuzz inputs. Well, I need to know where that fuzz input was, but let's see. I'm going to hack it in just to see if our information is getting propagated. 
And so at the when the fuzz case ends, we have we already have the buff and the len, which is great. Uh, we write everything in, but that won't set the access bits. And here's what we'll do. So we will read into this. Uh, do I have a way of peak? Um, read into perms. I think I need to add a peak perms. There we go. Get some mutable slice to permissions uh, for size bytes. And that's it. That's all it does. So we will request this. And I think. I think it's a perm. Yeah. So get access to perms. Have an address miss here. And we just return this. Just get mutable access to address.0 plus size. OK, or address integer overflow. And then get mute. And then OK, or that uh, to see if we missed the address space. And this will be peak perms. OK. And that one we just return. All right. So now, what I should be able to do is at the end here, I should be able to do emu.memory.peakperms for vert adder buff as you size len. OK, so this will get access to perms. And that should work. Nice. And now, we can go through for perm in perms um, if perm.0 and perm access is not equal to 0. And I'll put parens around here just because I like being explicit with my parentheses. We'll say if it has been accessed, print um, ii.iter.enumerate, print accessed memory at this. And this is not going to be an address. This is just an offset. But let's see if it works. Um, and we'll grab that, I guess. OK. Well, that's not a great sign. Um, I'm going to see what memory is readable. This should work. Am I not getting here? Uh, print got perms. Am I doing something stupid? Hmm. Buff. Oh, I was rereading those. That would make sense. OK. So now we can see, obviously, everything is readable in this memory region. And then if we say perm access, this will tell us what memory was accessed during that fuzz case. And we can see offset 47 is accessed. And sure enough, offset 47 is what gets accessed during that fuzz case. So now what we can do is we can actually save that information with the input uh, when we save it. Um, and the question is, how do I communicate this with the internal so it knows to do that? I'm not sure. Um, uh, inputs. So basically, anywhere that we add the inputs, is it only here? Oh, yeah, it is only here now. Nice. So what I need to do is have some way to communicate the accessed bits uh, for the fuzz input. Um, and we also need to add this uh, logic to the JIT, which won't be too hard to add. Um, what else? We should also add support to the emulator for the things that we added yesterday to the JIT. 
Um, the call stack stuff we should add support for. And what else? Yeah, we added the call stack stuff and the path hashing. We should, we should probably add both of those to the emulator, but we will get to that, I think. So I need some way to communicate to the internals of this of what memory should be marked as accessed. Um, and maybe I'll do that with a closure. Um, how do you know which offset is being accessed from a page? Well, I know every single access that occurs and every time a byte access occurs, I, I set the uh, access bit myself. So, corpus inputs push. But yeah, so now we know that byte 47 is what matters there. And I'm trying to think how I wanna do this. And I might do a reset with a closure. Um, um, I think a closure is easiest. Shit, I don't want to do this. Why is this always so tough? So we could pass in a closure here, and then when we go to save the input, we can grab the accessed bits. Um, yeah, let's just do that. We'll have an F here, and we'll say um, access bits is an F. And where f is a function which gets past a mutable reference to a emulator. And if we have where the fn... Mm, takes an emulator and that's it and it yields a uh, a vector of u8s okay uh, and this is actually a fn once which is nice and we'll pass in a um bop, 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 bop. we'll call it accessed bits with self okay and this is inputs a uh, linear list of inputs tuple is um and we should probably make a structure for these now yeah, let's just make a structure, get it out of the way. Uh, pub struct input. Um, insters is equal to u64. Um, the instruction count of the... Um, the instruction counts of the... most recently generated coverage from this input. This allows us to know how deep we need to fuzz this input. Instruction count, okay. Then we have the uh, data, the raw inputs, and then we will have a um, accessed, a bitmap indicating which bytes from data were accessed during the fuzz case. And we'll probably pre-process that. Um, yeah, we'll do this. Impl inputs, and we'll do fn new inputs insters data 
uh, creates a new input. We'll make it impossible to make this structure. Well, it's still pub. And then pubfn new this data and accessed. And then we will return an input. And this will be um, a sorted vector of bytes, which are used of indices from data, which are used during the fuzz case. So these are u sizes. So a sorted vector of indices from data, which are used during the fuzz case. And then we will process that uh, from uh, an instruction count, a raw input, and the accessed bitmap. Uh. Um, access. Mm. Yeah, we'll say the access. Uh, I might just change these to bools. Yeah, it's not going to be a bitmap. And the accessed uh, mapping associating uh, uh, data bytes to access ones. Okay. Assert that data.len is equal to accessed.len. And this will say um, accessed information. Eh. We'll just ignore it if it doesn't, if it's not in bounds. So let mute accessed. Um, hmm. We'll call this the avec is a vec new, uh, sorted vector of accessed indices in data. And then I'll say for I, I, um, let's uh, uh, num access is equal to standard compare minimum data.len, the smaller of the two, and access.len. So if we report access as an empty list, basically we're not recording access information, then we won't do anything in this loop. This loop will just terminate. So for ii and... For ii and access, and I'm just assuming that the bools will be easier to compute. So, like, it'll be easier for the provider to provide a list of bools, and then we can convert it here, rather than having the user do that uh, conversion. Um, I think this will just be better, but I'm not sure. Um, is accessed in access dot dot numac, right? It's the smaller of the two, so that slice is always fine. Iter enumerate, and then we'll say if is ac avec dot push ii. And honestly, I could probably, um, I could probably do that in a in a better, cleaner way. But whatever, we'll say um creates the a uh, vector of indices, and then we'll yield an input, which will be inputs, insters, data, and access is the avec. Okay. Uh, you can just ref that. Expected three arguments, and then expected a tuple with two elements. Yes, and we're gonna change that now. Inputs becomes an atomic vector of an input. And then this is going to break a lot of stuff temporarily. And here we'll do uh, input new insters. We'll actually record the instruction count here. Fuzz input will clone that. And then the access bits. Um, I should do the trick. Uh, create input.
Okay. And then reset doesn't have that. And then this is not happy at 681 because this needs to be a vector of bools. Okay. And then at 453, when we do a reset, well, we can safely do this. This will now not track any information. Um, discard that. And then at 465, this is now the input. And we'll extend from slice input.data. Set the timeout to input dot, um, insters plus 1 million. Input from tuple at 540. Yep. So where is this at? This isn't a worker on a crash. And the worker does reset as well, right? Yes, it does. Um... Well, what we can do is we can get the buffer and the length. Get the buffer and the length for the input. Okay, we have that done. And then um, input new, input stop push. And this will do an input. new with the emu timeout the data and the access bit closure in this case vec new so hopefully this will now build shit 542 oh we do this in multiple places that's loading the initial corpus in this case we actually don't know uh, what bytes are being used yet. Um, I'm going to temporarily disable that because I need to fix that when that rolls around. So I'm just going to make this uh, fix me. So that won't build if I uncomment it. And then at 542, because this one, I think I might need to run a fuzz case through before I load that corpus then so I can get that mapping. So mismatch types, 542, expected struct input, found tuple, and yes, because this one needs a input new emu timeout, and then a vec new. So this is not actually recording any information, but this has switched, hopefully, to the new format, expected vec. Oh, yeah, yeah, that actually takes the vector. Okay, access memory at 47. And what we will do is when we reset, we won't have new coverage. Correct, because when we fork, we won't have new coverage. Okay, so our first reset, we're fine. All right. So then, all we have to do is change this closure here to generating this. Get access to the perms. And then we will do a perms.iter.map x. And then we'll just say x.0, and we'll call it perm. Perm.0 and perm ac is not equal to zero dot collect. So that will create the vector. Basically get access to the permissions for that region. And this is based off of the emu, which we pass through here. So we don't have lifetime issues. So get access to the permissions. And then um, for any permission which has access set, if access is not equal to zero, then we collect those and that should 
we now use to create those inputs. And then we also will want to do this um, down where we do this. Um, let access is equal to this. Let access is equal to this. Do do do. And we just have to say it's a vec. And it should figure out that these are bools. But if it can't, whatever. So now, even on crashes, we record that information. So what we should have now is in our input, when we load an input, um, I'll just say if we don't have an input in the corpus, which is our case, emu.fuzz input extend from slice, and we'll say um, resize. And this will just be 128 times 1024, OU8. So I'll resize the fuzz input. So we should start off with an empty input. If we don't have any inputs in the corpus, we'll start off with an empty input. And then when we grab something from the corpus, um, this will hit new coverage because we haven't hit anything yet. And thus when that gets saved, we should be able to do this. Print sourcing from input. And this will be the input ID, which will be cell. And then we'll print the input.access, which will be the access bitmap. And this, hopefully, um, is less than or equal to len. Len worker, len. Um, what is len then? What's going on here? Buff and len. I was worried about this. I didn't know if these would be in the right state. They should be. Yeah, 131072. Resize to 128 times 1024. Mutate some shit. Um. Oh, we gotta do this way out here. It's getting clobbered. Okay. So, post cases a second. No, so no inputs are being saved, and that means. Um, do I not have coverage in the emulator? Oh, maybe I don't. Wow, the emulator's really falling behind. Okay, so we will... Oh, we should update the emulator. I really don't want to, but we really need to. So let's make sure everything's at parity here. Um, basically, only th things that matter are mainly things that go into the corpus. And here we have compare coverage, which we don't have as an option in run emu. Okay. Yeah, we got to fix this. So run emu. This will... Um, have breakpoint callbacks. If enable tracing, we push the registers, push the opcode, which we don't need that. Um, Insters exec plus equals one, which is good. So we do that here in the JIT. Um, oh, we're not actually in the JIT yet. So in the JIT, we need to make sure we do everything identically. Um, If visit, if visited dot insert PC, already visited that PC, read the instruction, and then we generate 
insters exec plus equals one. And then if tracing is enabled, we push the entire register state to the trace, and we do that. Enable tracing, push that to the trace. Uh, I'm actually going to do this more in sequence of what we do, just so they're at parity. Then insert breakpoints if needed. So then we handle breakpoints. And then we go through all these. And I think coverage event is really all we need to handle is we need to add support for these coverage events. Um, OK. And this is a coverage event here. And let's see. We just have to make this identical, which we should be able to do. So coverage event. Um, so what do we do? We get the number of bits in the coverage map, blah, blah, blah. Must be a power of two. OK, that's fine. And then we'll do if. Um, here we check the timeout. So we'll say if insters exec is greater than state dot timeout uh, return um, vm exit return error vm exit timeout. Okay, check for timeout. And then we generate this path hash state. Uh, this is probably self dot state self.state.path hash um, is self.state.path hash. Um, I forget how you rotate in Rust. Rotate left. I'm pretty sure there. there's definitely a U32. Um, yeah, it's just dot rotate left. Rotate left by seven. XOR the two. So this is uh, update the path hash. And then we'll do um, compute the hash, which will be let hash is equal to uh, from XOR this XOR to XOR this, compute the hash, let hash is equal to hash, uh, this can just be mute, hash xor equals hash 13, 1743, hash and equals the hash mask, which is coverage bitmap bits minus one. Okay, and then let index is equal to hash divided by 64. Let bit is equal to one u64 shift by um, hash mod 64. If self.state.cov bitmap index and bit, if that, is equal to zero, then return VM exits. Um, so exit timeout, and that timeout will bubble to here. Exit reason is a timeout. If the exit reason was breakpoint, we do this stuff. Um, if it was coverage, we have to generate this. Um, so the way that we'll do this is we will do uh, self dot um, notify coverage, and we can do self dot state dot cov from is equal to. The from self.state.cov2 is equal to 2. We don't need an exit reason and we don't need a reentry PC because we just that just happens by nature. 
So this should now be at parity of what we do, except notify coverage needs to be implemented. But if the bit is zero, um, does this set the bit in the coverage bit? Did that? Uh, coverage event. Oh, yes, I do. Okay, I was about to say, woof, big oof there. Uh, Self.state.cov bitmap index or or equals with the bits. And then we set the uh, from and the to. We don't need the reentry PC. We don't need an exit reason because we don't actually exit. We, we have no reason. We don't have to exit out of the JIT because we're not in the JIT. So this is update the coverage bitmap. And then everything else here should be at parity of what we do. Obviously, we have to put these in all the same locations. And then we'll implement this, which is update code coverage. And this one will be relatively simple. We'll just say self dot notify coverage. And hopefully, I don't have any mutable borrows on anything. And I can just do that here. But I'm kind of afraid I won't be able to. Um, fn notify coverage mute self okay uh, code coverage um used internally by the emulator and jit to notify us when new uh, code coverage is hit Fall through to re-execute instruction. Yep. So hopefully this isn't too crazy. 766. We have no access to the corpus. Now we do. Um... Notify code coverage. That's true. Because um, we have a we have a different meaning of coverage. So code coverage is different than just coverage. Okay, so that builds. Uh, obviously, it's not doing anything yet. So what we need to do is coverage event. So any place. Oh, that handles the different types of coverage. Hmm. So we should also add support for compare coverage. If we don't do this now, the emulator will just fall further and further behind and it will become a shit show. So we just have to do this, unfortunately. Just get it over with. Code cleanup is important. So here, if uh, compare coverage is enabled, then we'll do um, let's temp is equal to um, a xor a xor not b let temp is equal to temp shift 1 and temp uh, shift 2 and temp shift 4 and temp let temp is equal to temp and magic okay and then we register this um we'll do let uh hash is equal to pc.0 xor state uh self.state.call stack hash NFF, um, XOR, self.state.path hash, and OXFF. And then we register some compare coverage. Um, and...
Do I still want to do this? Yeah, because that's the from and the to. So I think I'll just do coverage event, name of the coverage event, and then I have a hash, and then the res, which is the bit map thing. So this should be the same way that we do it. Obviously, we don't have a way of registering that compare coverage. Um, so I'll move this. Self.notify compare coverage corpus. We'll do the same thing. FN notify compare coverage. Mute self corpus corpus. Uh, get this done. This will be um, uh, register that new compare coverage has occurred. Okay. And we'll comp this out temporarily because we're not using it. But we now have a way to do this. And what we can do is we can say, if we have a from and a to, we register those. We can say, if uh, cov source is equal to uh, code coverage, uh, is coverage, then code coverage, else if cov source is, and we could use a match here, but. Yeah, we'll use a match. Match cov source coverage. Otherwise, we will do uh, compare coverage self dot notify compare coverage corpus. Okay, and then we'll do anything else unreachable. Okay, so then this, we'll call that with compare coverage, which will register this as compare coverage, and we pass in the hash and the temp, which is the to and the from, and then everything just kind of behaves the same as what we were doing before. Okay, so now I just have to use these. Coverage event, bang. So compare coverage uses it, and then down here, at jump and link, we want to uh, coverage, events, coverage. And we'll give a PC.0 and a target. Uh, and target in this case is PC dot wrapping add for. No, this is the target. So let target is equal to this. Nah. Come on. Come on. There we go. So we will register the target here. Um, coverage event. And then this is PC.0, which is where we currently are. And then the target of where we want to go to. We got to do stack hash as well. So we might as well do that as we're here. We'll say um, if inst.rd is equal to register ra, then if self.state.call stack ints is greater than or equal to the max call stack, return error vm exit call stack full. Otherwise, state call stack, oops, self.state.call stack at um, self.state.call stack ints is equal to the return address, which is, uh, we'll say ret adder, which will be this. Okay, generate a coverage event from PC to the targets. If it's RA, 
check the call stack. Call stack is full. Um, in this situation, put it at call stack ints, and we'll do self.state.call stack ints plus equals one. And then we'll do a self.state.call stack hash uh, equals self.state.call stack hash um, dot rotate left by seven XOR with ret adder. Okay. Um, update call stack. This will update call stack hash. So rotate left, XOR the return address. And that is on RA. Okay. So then coverage events. So that was jump and link. Now we have jump and link register. And this is kind of the same thing. Um, target is equal to that. Let ret adder is equal to this. And then we can say if self.state.call stack ints is greater than zero, it, uh, let CSE is equal to self.state.call stack ints minus one. If target is equal to self.state.call stack CSE, then uh, self.state.call stack is equal to uh, hash is equal to self.state.call stack hash XOR target um, dot rotate right by seven. So XOR that with the target, and then we'll do self.state.call stack ints minus equals one. Um, uh, try to handle returns for checking to see if we're indirectly branching to a branching to a return address. A DNS sucks ass. What are you trying to do? Then we do coverage event coverage from PC.0, uh, in this case PC, to the target, which is just this. Okay, 857, this. Okay. Uh, as you size. Yikes. Yikes. Um, max call stack. Honestly, let's just go and change that. All right, 938, yep, this is just PC. Uh, coverage bitmap, can't index. Where is that? That's in, um, this coverage bitmap is actually at uh, self.coverage bitmap. Corpus.coverage bitmap. Ooh, shit. Um, it's actually on safe. Uh, CBE, coverage bitmap entry, is equal to unsafe self.state.coverage dot dot 
Uh, this is corpus coverage bitmap as pointer dot offset index. So yeah, we're just doing some stuff here. Have fuck with aliasing. We should probably. Um. So that is safe. Then unsafe DRF CBE. Unsafe. Or equals bit. Um, sixty nine. Oh, we weren't using the corpus. Now we are. Okay. As I size. So take the index, index it into there, and then we'll do a core pointer read volatile. And here we'll do core um, let old is unsafe core pointer read volatile CBE. This will be old. Then, if so, we'll do a core pointer right volatile. Um, <laughs> thanks, uh, Ultra. Right volatile to CBE with old orbit. as mute pointer. Okay, we'll just do this as mute blah. What do you mean? As pointer offsets coverage bitmap. So vec u64. So this should be immutable u64. Called unsafe. Oh, offset is unsafe. Okay. Well, I can do that. Um. Eh, this is fine. Okay. Oh, nice. Well, there you go. Um, that's, uh, it's not complete, but that, you weren't supposed to see that yet. Um, <laughs> coverage event here. Indirect branch, don't need that. And then we have uh BEQ fuck why did we do these in a million different places um let target is equal to this oh. okay target is equal to this change all these to targets Do why am I why why am I doing it like this?
I guess I have that unimplemented. Match this. Let's take branch is equal to this. RS1 is equal to RS2. You see, you see where this made no sense? Take branch. Wow, that's hard. Um, back. RS1 is equal to RS2. Wow. Wow, look at that. Code's readable now. Branch if not equal. RS1's not equal to RS2. Uh, we have the bacon, lettuce, and tomato. RS1 as I64 is less than RS2 as I64. Okay. BGE. RS1 as I64. RS2 as I64. Just because we can. Uh, branch of less than unsigned, which is just RS1 as U64, branch of greater than unsigned, or equal unsigned, RS1 as U64, equal to RS2 as U64. Guessing this is an emulator? Yes, it is. Oh, that's so much better. Determine if we should take a branch. And then we have the compare coverage. RS1, RS2. And then, oh, did we add that? I think we did, yeah, we did. So uh, generate compare coverage. And then we'll say, only if it's taken, oh, yeah, yeah. We'll do uh, coverage, event, coverage, pc.0 to target. If we're not taking the branch, then we have a coverage event from the pc.0 to, uh, in this case, pc is already resolved. Um, we can just do uh, pc.wrapping add four. Okay, handle the conditional branch, and then if it's taken, we're going from PC to target. If it's not taken, we're going PC to the next instruction. And then I think that's it. Um, read fault checks, read and write, uh, write fault checks, compare coverage, oh. So what I'm looking for is I want to make sure that we do compare coverage everywhere that we do. So here, we do it on branches. Then we also want to do it on SLTIs, which will be a um, compare coverage of RS1 and M as U64, All right? Generate compare coverage there, then here, we do the same thing. It's just RS1 and that is a U64. And then SLT, same thing. But this is now RS1 and RS2. And SLTU, okay. And then this loops back around, okay. Coverage events, we do Um, okay, so we should handle everything. Okay, um, 893, PC.0, that's just PC. Oh, <gasps> nice. 974. Mm, oh, yeah.
the target. I don't need that. Uh, jailer. Ret adder. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to move this down here just so we don't accidentally use it. Okay, so there we go. So now we can see sourcing from input 47, or from input 0, and this is saying that the bytes that are used in input 0 by the fuzzer, or by the target, uh, is at 47. If we look at our test code, we see that the first access is buff 47. So eventually, oh, there we go. Look at this. Sourcing from input 1. In input 1, clearly, that one got the 47 byte right. It put 20 there. And then it's saying that it also sources from 9382. So now we know exactly where in the input uh, we should actually work on corrupting bytes. Um, isn't that fucking cool? So let's see how many fuzz cases this takes to find. We'll run it. We're running single threaded, I think. Yeah, we're running single-threaded, we're running in the emulator mode, and we're seeing how long it's going to take for us to get that coverage. So, basically, uh, it's going to take a, a while, isn't it? What did we determine? Like a, a two, 1 in 200,000 chance? There, we found 1. So we got through 1 byte. Now we have a 1 in 400,000 chance of finding it. Um... Yeah, so it'll be a, a 1 in 200,000, then a 1 in 400,000, uh, and then a 1 in 600,000. This should take like 1.2 million cases. So we should get to the next one, the next byte we should be able to get at uh, 600,000, roughly. Obviously there's noise here, it's, it is random. Oh, we already got it. Uh, okay, e-break. Well, we don't handle e-break right now. Let's, uh, uh, return error VM exit software break point, I think is what I call it. But we know that that's how long it took to find it. And we'll just do info. We'll just paste that up, that up here. So, and this should now build, uh, VM exit... Uh, call stack full e-break. Hmm. Done. Okay. Now, we have knowledge when we pick up an input. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to corrupt one byte at a time. Um, so we're going to, we pick up this input. And as part of this, um, yeah, we'll just say uh, let mute accessed is a vec new um, vector indicating which indices of the input to mutate. So then we're going to say accessed clear, yeah. So clear access because we don't know, and then we'll do access dot extend from slice from the input dot accessed. Okay, update accessed information. Uh, set a timeout which can reach all coverage for this input, and then this is uh, copy the inputs. Update access information. So now we have access to that. So then, is it going to be smart mutation? Uh, no, we're just going to flip bits. We're going to flip one byte. We're going to say, um, let's index. This is going to be the index to flip, which will be uh, access.len, rng.rand, mod this. Let index is equal to, um, oh, this can just be accessed, this. So we pick. Uh, pick a random known affected byte to mutate, and then we'll just do um, emu.fuzz input 
index is equal to rng.rand as u8. Okay. So here we go. Um, div by zero on 495 because some of these we won't have anything. So if the fuzz input line is greater than zero, um, actually in this case we only actually care about this. If accessed dot len is greater than zero. And did I lose internet? Yes. No. Wait. It's iffy. All right. We're, I think we're fine, though. And there it is. There's the crash. So a crash that previously took us 300,000 fuzz cases is now taking, I mean, who knows, hundreds of fuzz cases? Um, <laughs> isn't that cool? <laughs> isn't that nifty? Um... Let's see. I kind of want to know what uh, fuzz case it is, but that's kind of hard, you know? Single core, I kind of know, but whatever. It, it now should take uh, 256. So one in 256. And then we have to pick the right input again. So 1 in 256 uh, times 0. 0.5. And then 1 over 256 times 0. 0.333333, or divided by 3. Multiply those all together. No, add those together. Um, so div by 2, div by 3. Add those together. And this says, theoretically, it should take, seriously, 139 cases to find that? No. Why am I adding them together? Um, I want to multiply the inverse, but whatever. Um, I can probably just cheese this. New crash. Just because this hasn't synced yet, it's very likely this hasn't synced yet. So we can do local stats dot fuzz cases, and we can see what fuzz case ID this was. One hundred forty-five. Mm, I think that's synced. Uh, so we'll do stats dot lock dot unwrap. Uh, dot fuzz cases plus the local, just in case it merged in to the global, which it probably did. 834 cases, 1800 cases, 2000 cases, 2000 cases, 2000 cases. It's an improvement over 300,000. <laughs> I think, I think that's my point. <laughs> this is improvement. It's an improvement. Now, um, I don't know if I'm actually going to have time to do taint tracking because I have someone coming over soon. Um, but what we can do is talk about why taint tracking is important because the input could be copied by the program under test. The, this input, rather than just directly using the input, it's possible that this could do a uh, uh, char temp 131072 and do a mem copy into temp of buff and len. And at this at this stage, uh, it would then access this. But at this point, everything has been marked as accessed in the input, and we don't really actually know anymore what's been used. But to do that, you need to do something called taint tracking, which is effectively propagating that accessed bit. So what I would do is I would actually color memory. So I would indicate, um, somehow I would indicate you know, where th certain things came from. And I'll say like, oh, this came from the input. And what that would allow me to do is that when I do loads and stores and reads and writes and additions and subtractions and whatever I do to that input, I would actually get to follow that along. So what I would see is that the byte from the buffer gets copied into something else. And then that thing gets used in a compare. And at that point, I would say basically any compares that operate on tainted data are, are the bytes that we should be flipping from the input. But generally not possible to know where it came from. 
I mean, you know, you know where it came from. You just, well, that can get complex if you and things together. But you, you typically don't know the math applied to it, but you do know which bytes it came from. You know which bytes it could have come from. But, like, it's possible. Uh, taint tracking has some difficult problems where if you do, like, temp and 5 and temp and 6, I can know that this came from either temp 5 and temp... Like, that temp 5 and temp 6 had an effect. So both of those bytes are involved in that compare process. But I don't really know the arithmetic and what happened there to cause that. If you want to do that, that's called symbolic execution. And when you propagate taint, you basically propagate a mathematical expression of the sources for everything. And then once you get to the branch, you attempt to solve that equation to find a, the byte combinations that allow you to go down a compared branch. And that is a very, very hard problem. And these expressions get way too complicated and symbolic effectively starts falling apart on larger targets um but with the taint stuff you can get you can make some better progress by determining which components are used as part of a compare and it's likely not too many it's it's not it's it's unlikely that there are 50 different bytes used for a compare it's likely just a couple different bytes and that makes it much more brute forcible so um but yeah, so tin analysis is black box symbolic. I mean, I'm sure there are some purists and some like academics who have some very rigid definitions for those things and would disagree, but I would say yes, right? It's, it's basically a lossy translation of the sets. Well, typically taint tracking is actually not done back to the input. Taint tracking typically colors this so it would basically mark buff as a special color so it would say like uh marked right and it would say like marked as blue right and this copy would copy it would propagate the marking so this would not be marked or other things in the program wouldn't be marked you'd only mark the things you're interested in tracking through the program and then what we'd see is that this temporary buffer would get marked blue as well after the mem compare so at the start no marking and then afterwards uh temp uh is now marked blue and that means that when this access occurs let's say this is now operating on temp instead it would know that this compare is marked blue and since this is marked blue you know that it came from something about it came from the input and this basically can tell you whether or not a conditional branch even is affected by the input because if if a conditional branch is not affected by the user input then you probably shouldn't focus your energy on trying to fuzz that thing it's just it's not something that you have control over but taint tracking can uh, get difficult when you determine if you want to do uh exact memory copy taint where basically you propagate taint if and only if the byte is moved or copied or cloned or whatever you want to call it. And then you also have like an arithmetic taint. So uh, basically one version of taint would say, and we'll simplify this and we'll say, um, we'll say uh, character temp is zero, no marking. And then character temp is equal to buff five uh, marked blue, right? And then, uh, We'll say, yeah, temp is that. And then we'll do temp times equals five, right? And the question is, should this still be marked blue or should this be cleared? Because you now no longer know. And there are reasons to do both. If you mark this as blue, then you still know that something about this branch, when you get to this, because let's say this is uh, temp, uh, let's just say this is temp is 20, right? If you propagate taint through arithmetic, you now know that the um, that this temporary variable has been tainted by um, the input. And since you know that it's marked as blue, you know that the taint uh, for that, you, you know that temporary has some 
affiliation with the input. You don't know what it is. You don't know what math has been performed. You don't know the direct copies or any of that stuff, right? All you know is that temp potentially <laughs> uh, came from the input. Now that gets really tough when you have things that turn into knobs. So what happens here? Is this still marked blue? Right, how do you handle that? And these are all decisions you have to make when you're making a taint engine. Typically, I say, put these in fucking constants and make it tunable and make it so your execution engines can support these. Because there is a nice uh, effect to say, no marking here. Because now you know that if a branch is tainted, if it's marked as blue, you know for sure that there is a one-to-one -one correlation between an, a, some byte in the input and some byte in what you are comparing. And that has a very, very, very useful meaning in that you can maybe figure out what byte caused that. So you can either propagate taint tracking. So I am planning on actually, because I don't give a shit about memory usage, I plan on propagating taint with an index. So the marking here would be a blue, and this would be five. So, and this would be a U size, right? So I need to have, for every single byte in memory, I would have a U size and maybe a couple more bits. I would probably end up having, for every single byte in memory, I would have an additional nine bytes of taint. But this would associate back to the location, or the, it could just be the virtual address. It doesn't even matter at that point. And what this would allow you to do, if you clear this marking, and then you see that, uh, let's just keep it in this situation, temp5, and then you would know this temp in memory, the virtual address that holds temp, which happens to now be on the stack, you would know that this variable is marked blue five u size. And thus, you know that this condition is affected by a specific, or you know that one of the bytes comprising, if this was a 32 bit thing, right, then you would have four different sources of taint for the different bytes on the stack for that variable. So it would basically allow you to directly associate the bytes for a compare condition directly back to where they were sourced from in the input. And if you don't propagate on arithmetic, you know for sure that the bytes directly show up in that compare as they do from the input. And that means if you see the other side, in this case, let's say this is a uh, leet leet there, and in this case you have a uint32t temp, and this does uh, times uint32t uh, buff 5, right? So if it does this, if it reads a uint32 and then it compares it here, well, technically you have multiple markings, right? We're not marking this variable. We don't know what a variable is. We're marking the bytes that make up the storage of that variable on the stack. So the addresses that correspond to temp would actually look like, um, uh, technically, uh, yeah, they would look like this. I don't care about Indianness. Um, so then what you would be able to see is that this compare uses, it's a 32 bit comparison, all four bytes that are sourced from are tainted, and it's trying to compare for equality against leet. Well, you know what I can do? I can now go back into the original input and I can just set buff five is equal to OX37 and buff six is equal to OX13 because I know that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between the input bytes and that comparison. And that is the reason why sometimes you don't want to propagate taint through arithmetic or maybe you want to run both modes at the same time because then you know whether or not the input affected a branch and you also know for branches that were directly affected how they were directly affected. Does that make sense? Isn't that fucking cool? <laughs> this, my friends, is why I don't give a fuck about native execution and fuzzing. This is why I believe emulation is by far and away the correct way to do fuzzing. Because, yeah, sure, native execution maybe is a 20 or 30x faster. 
Congratulations, you're, you're doing 30 times the fuzz cases, but my fuzz case density is a thousand or 10,000 X yours. In the case of this program, right, when we have a 128K input and we are only corrupting one byte in, in, our, in our example that we literally already have completed and demonstrated, our fuzzing density is 1,300 times more effective than fuzzing. So I would take, this would still be faster wall clock time if my emulator was 1,300 times slower than native execution. And that is why I don't give a fuck about the raw performance of the fuzzer when it comes to, um, the, the execution of instructions. I care about the scalability. I care about the ability for me to take something and multiply it by the speed of my cores. So I benefit from my cores, but I don't care about the raw per core execution speeds. Um, <sighs> uh, let me see when my uh, friend's planning to come over and then Depend on when they're coming over, I will... I think we probably could do the uh, direct taint. The arithmetic taint will be a little bit hard. Actually, we we still have to make this work on our JIT. Ya fucks. You didn't remind me. <laughs> we implemented all this stuff on the emulator, and now for the first time ever, our emulator is actually ahead of our JIT. Um, enable the JIT, and now this won't work. Now it will, it'll still find the bug because our JIT's plenty fast. <laughs> right? Uh, one input, and we'll get that next input soon here. How many fuzz cases a second were we getting? Oh, we're just bottlenecking on reset anyways. Oh, we're actually probably bottlenecking on that fuzz generation and input. Oh, yeah, we're bottlenecking on injecting that uh, input for sure. Basically, since we're, we, every fuzz case, we write 128K to memory. And we propagate uh, bits, and we set a bunch of flags, and we do a bunch of one-byte writes and stuff. It's just a pain in the ass. Interpreter being faster is, is, is funny. Yeah, it's just because they're both doing the same thing, right? We're not spending any time in the JIT. And we're not spending that much time resetting, which means we're spending our time injecting the input or gathering coverage, which is possible. But uh, in this case, I don't think that's what's actually going on. So, obviously, we're unable to find the bug, even though the emulator is. So why is the emulator better than us? Well, that's because the emulator uh, on loads actually propagates the uh, bits. So what we'll do here is we will set the accessed bits. Uh, and we also need to update dirty then in that situation. Um, bam. So this will um, uh, set the set the accessed bits. And then that's gonna update the dirty bitmap. Because otherwise, we won't clear the access bits when we reset. So, unfortunately, now everything gets dirtied as we read it, so we don't get too much of a speed up. Um, but most things get dirtied anyways in a lot of situations, so it's not that big of a deal. So in this case, we will OR in, based on the access size, we will OR in... Um, oh, fuck me. I'm not using named formats. Not that big of a deal. So we'll or this with the um, ULL. Okay. So this will be the load type for this one. Then we have a load type again. And then we have the um, this is the access mask. So, and we'll do let mute access mask is equal to OU64. And this will be access mask perm ack that. So now we have an access mask and then we'll update 
That's like ballpark where we're getting to. And then we want to divide this by the dirty block size, I think. Yeah, dirty block size here. Um, put some semis out here. Perm act, not found in the scope. Okay, so this should now work. Um, yeah, there's the crash, right? And we immediately find the crash, right? Because now we propagate that access bit. Isn't that cool? So what we can do now is we can, um, this loads the initial corpus. Um, and I think, I think I might put the corpus in a different place. So we have a corpus here. Um, I might do this corpus vec new. Well, this is uh, atomic vec. And then we'll do uh, corpus dot corpus dot push the data, and we won't hash it either. So all we're gonna do is um, add the corpus inputs uh, to to the corpus, and then we just have to set that inputs. Uh, linear list of all um, uh, corpus inputs. This will be corpus. And these have no information because we haven't run them through. But we're going to have a very low chance of using things from the corpus. 909. Push. Expected box. Yeah, we got to wrap it in a box. It's kind of funny because it's a boxed vec. And then... Inputs.lin... Okay, so then we will say if rng.rand mod 8, eh, 16, not equal to 0, and this. So we have a 1 in 16 chance of using something from our input database. Otherwise, uh, if corpus.inputs, uh, corpus.corpus.len is greater than 0, this is... Uh, um, build upon a previous input from the coverage guided inputs. And then this is build upon uh, an input from the corpus. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll do like 32. And then here we'll do let cell is equal to rng.rand mod corpus dot corpus if let sum I think I'll do this. Hmm. So one in thirty two we build on that, and then here we'll say if emu.fuzz input.len is zero, which means if we have not selected an input, which can happen in this condition as well. So basically, if our input length is still zero after that, then, and there's something from the corpus, then we'll build from the corpus, and we'll do uh, uh, emu.fuzz input extend from slice uh, corpus.corpus. Uh, just select it, and then if emu.fuzz input.len is still zero, um, just make a dummy size. And here we'll just say uh, input. Just make a blank input. Um... I'll just do 8k, right? 
This is specific to our target, so we don't really care. And then we have the mutator. Now this mutator, if access len is greater than zero, so um, in these situations, we want to set access to um, um, oh yeah, else uh, we don't have access knowledge, just dumb fuzz, right? Uh, else if emu dot fuzz input dot len is greater than zero, then we'll just do this for fuzz input dot len. Right, so we'll get the length of, we'll pick a random index and corrupt it. And that's just corrupting one byte, so what we'll want to do here is for blah in zero dot dot rng dot rand mod 16. So we want to corrupt up to 16 bytes. And depending on the different ways we can fuzz, if access line is greater than zero, then we corrupt eight things from accessed. Otherwise, we corrupt or up to 16 random things. And then we pass everything through and we inject the input in. So this should, ooh, corpus.corpus.len. Um, oh yeah, and we have to do get here. Corpus. Okay. Because it's an atomic table, there's a chance that it's there's a race condition there and it's not filled in, so we have to do this. So if we were able to get that input, then we extend it. So we should be able to find the bug here. Um, why is it taking so long? There it is. Um... If rng dot ran mod 32 is not equal to that, oh, we needed to run cases. Oh, the, yeah, we needed to run 32 cases to pick up the small input. It was very rare that we picked up the small input. And then once we did, we were able to finally feed it back because we got new coverage. Um, and we would actually find this bug much faster if we had a bounds check here. So if we had a check to actually make sure everything's in bounds, um, if we said, if len is less than 120 attempts, 1024, continue. And this will prevent us from polluting the uh, input corpus with hitting this coverage with an input that can't get further. So we'll say, if the length is less than that, uh, oh, return. Make, and we'll just copy that. And we should be able to find this faster now. Obviously, we're jitting. Once the jit's done, we'll be able to go faster. Hopefully, we'll be able to find this faster. Two inputs. Hmm. We're not crashing here. I think we're just... Pick a random thing from the input. Uh, picked accessed. I'm curious if we're just rarely picking up those inputs. No. Oh, um, because we're corrupting so much. Since we have. We have such a high chance of corrupting multiple things, and since we now know exactly what we need to corrupt, we actually have a pretty high chance of... So we need to pick the right input. Um, I think that's it. Let me, let me see. I mean, it should only be decreasing our chance to find it by 25%, because we need to only corrupt one byte at a time when we're progressing. So let's just see what happens here. Still taking longer. Um... Um, print corrupting this index. It doesn't matter too much. We still find it, right? Corrupting that. Um, huh. 
Huh. And our input selection should be good. If that, if the length is zero, so it won't be. If the length is zero, then resize to a blank. Maybe it's this is killing us. Having that blank input be so small to start. Mm, that shouldn't matter. I'm curious what frequency it is picking up that input. Yikes. Um, cause it should it should be at least a four x more difficult to find here because we end up over corrupting in a lot of situations. Um, but I don't think it should take this long. What if I get rid of that? So we have that. If rng.randmod32 is not equal to zero and there's an input in the corpus. Like we're, we're heavily biased towards this. Pick a random input from the corpus, copy it, set the timeout, update access information. Um, this should very rarely happen, this. So if I get rid of this, and if no input was selected, we just set the base to there. This should only take about four times longer to hit. Uh, we, did we break it? If it's less than that, return. But we're hitting the one that goes to 47, so we should be able to get past that. Um, uh, resize that, fuzz input.len, okay, I'm just going to see what this is, I'm, I'm curious what that uh, fuzz input length is, it should basically always be 131072, yeah, it is, okay, Right in the fuzz inputs, and resize to this. This should happen rarely. If it's not equal to zero, and the corpus input length is there, this should be. Very rare. Yeah, this is much less common. Um, do I have an II? Local stats of false cases. This is going to keep resetting, but it will give us an approximate spacing between resets. Yeah, right, it's it's approximately once every uh, 32. Yep. And then the only thing that would make sense is the corruption amount. We have access to information. Let me try it in the emulator just in case I broke something. I'm very confused now. Um, I 
Okay, same problem. Good. Buff. What is happening? We have two inputs, so we pretty much immediately find, well, one of the inputs gets coverage, and one of them won't have an accessed length. But we should, at a decent frequency, if we print this moose here, and change this to a one, I'm trying to figure out if I broke something, or if I'm just doing something stupid. Yeah, we're very frequently corrupting the 9382, which is what you want to corrupt. And then, will you write that buffer in? Okay. And emu.fuzz input index. What is that value? We should immediately get it once we hit an 11 in there. Yeah, like look how frequently we're throwing 11 in there. Um, so we'll say if emu fuzz input index is equal to hex 11, print this. Yeah, like these should be a coverage increase. Okay, let's take a look at the binary. Maybe it did some weird shit. Um, load that branch if less than unsigned. Um, where's the bounce check? Um, A5 is from, compares A4 which is S0 minus 32. Yeah. So this gets the length and then compares it. If it's less than unsigned 20, then it goes here. Oh, it changed the shape of the program. So why would adding that length check, why would that length check not be an explicit why wouldn't this bounds check the length for less than that? Why is it changing the length check for each of the bytes? Oh, maybe it's not. Fuzz me. Make. Actually, where is that bounce check? Branch of less than unsigned for 20 hex. There's the e break. If it's not equal to 32. Oh, that is, oh, as load upper immediate shit. Whoops. 
Um, okay. So we are hitting 101d8. We see a 101d8 transition. And we see that branching to a 10204. So we see that failing. So we never see it succeeding in finding the 17, which I think is 11, which is at byte 24A6. I'm confused, man. I don't know why we're not hitting this. No, it was a load upper immediate. It's fine. Um, if that is equal to 11 hex. Okay, what's all the coverage we see? 101d8. So we're stuck on that. 101d8. This is where we're stuck. Load immediate 17. Uh, which is this 11. And we put it in there. Um... I have a test thing here. This will make sure that all memory got reset. I think memory is not getting reset or something. Like I don't understand how we can put 11 there and then it doesn't hit that branch. Watch as I found a bug in my emulator. <laughs> okay. No, it seems to be working. What the hell? Like we're putting in a 9382 there. Or we're putting in an 11 to 9382. Like, how is that not progressing it? We do that once, then we get to the end. What? What the fuck is going on? Uh, emu.fuzz input. I hope it's a bug in my emulator, something. Cause this will be a lot easier to repro. Uh, 9382. On. On. Okay, so a lot of them will have a 20 hex, which is correct. Um, OX20 space OX11. Yeah. How is that not? How is that not getting it further? What?
101 DC. We should see a 101 DC edge. And we don't. Right from the fuzz input into the buffer. Is the length getting fucked? No, that would make no sense. Is the write not going to memory correctly? It's gonna be an obvious bug when we get there. Uh, one, three, one, oh, seven, two. Um. I am so confused. Is there a collision in my hashing for the coverage bitmap? Like that's the only thing that I feel like would make sense here. And if that's the case, then that's really scary. Uh, it means that I really need to improve my hash then. But I feel like that's, I feel like that's unlikely. Let's get rid of the JIT and we can, uh, we can see what happens. Same thing, okay. So then in the emulator, we'll go to um, um, oh yeah. So we are interested specifically in a branch if not equal. So we can go find the coverage event for the emulator for a branch if not equal, which is here. And we'll say um, PC target. I'm looking for a non-taken branch actually. This might be a little spewy. Grep 101d8. Yeah. Ooh. Do we have a shitty hash? 101d8 to a 101dc, and we're not seeing that. Yeah, there's no 101 DC in here. Okay, so let's look at our hashing algorithm. This is actually huge. I'm really happy about this. Um, so our current hash is and hopefully there's a massive flaw in this and it will be obvious. Um, coverage event. Oh, and where's that fucking code? Here. Okay, let's take a look at what's going on. Um, shit, I have no good way of copying this. E, test, paste. Python. Okay, we are going to take this and XOR it with this, and then we're going to XOR it with this and X or that with this. Hash is equal to this. Hash X or equals hash 13 shift by 17 shift by 43. Uh, fuck it, I can just print it from the code. Why am I doing this? 
Um. Coverage event here will print the um, hex, hex, and then the index. So we'll do a from to. Is it compare coverage? I wonder if it's compare coverage screwing us over. Um. Hmm. Oh. I think it is compare coverage. I think compare coverage is killing me here. I need to um figure out how to make these hashes a little bit stronger. I think these hashes are good. Um 102.04. Unless we're not even hitting that code. One on one D8. Yeah, that's good. Like, these two are much different. So then I want to see if this happens. This. That's the hash. Whoa. Holy fuck. Um Well, this might be massive. Okay, so our compare coverage Oh, any indirect wow, any fall through. Yeah, this is really bad. Any fall through. Yep. Yep, cuz it's always 4. <laughs> well, that was terrible. How the fuck did I do that? Um, um, what if I do this? Shuffle that shit around a bit. And then hash, unless there's actually a really good hash algorithm for something like this. All I want to do is I want to take two U64s and get a decent hash. Does anyone know of a good hashing algorithm for that? It has to be fast as fuck. So I can do this. I can basically shuffle this in at a later phase, right? This should be much better. Um, okay, this is the one I care about. And it's only that one, right? So this basically means that the from and the two will get shuffled around a little bit more than just the, than just XORing them together to produce a four. Right, so we have the from, we XOR it in with some other shit so that these, these random bits propagate a little bit harder here. And then we merge in the, um, 
We merge in the two, and then we shuffle that even more such that we get some of the top bits into the lower bits. Um, this is literally Zorshift. This is an RNG. Like, this is the internals of a random number generator. Um, dude, that is huge. I'm so glad I found that. That's a catastrophic failing of this tool. Um... This should be able to find it. There it is. Yeah, and it finds it pretty fast. Um, when we add this in, it'll take a little bit longer because it needs to mutate less. And then I can add this back in, and everything should now work. This should now work in this like full state. It'll take a well. That was actually really fast. Oh, we can see the frequency that it finds it. I guess the e-break. Um, oh, yeah. If we changed this, we would see a lot more of the e-break cases. Basically, we're only seeing a tiny percent. This should converge to 25% e-break or something like that. It'll be pretty high. But basically, this means we don't modify it so it still trashes. Yeah, I think I do want a chance of no corruption. I do like that. Because that gives me the ability to feed in a corpus input to get the basis of it. I have a chance of not corrupting a, a valid input that was fed in through the corpus. Okay, so... um. Let's see if there's a good hashing algorithm. XX hash. Yeah, I want small keys. Um uh small key hash. That's not what I want. Um, what is XX hash? Like, what is the lot? Where's the math? Show me it in Rust. Okay, repo, source, next, mm. Yeah, all these, like, I just want to take two U64s and make a decent hash out of them. Um, hmm. I'd really just like to find a fucking description of what it is. Algorithm, okay. And I think it's still doing good on SM Hasher. Let's take a look. Which one is this the one that's being updated now? No, that's old. This one's getting updated still. Full cache, that's my hash. <laughs> um 
We'll switch this to this for now. Okay. Oh, they're not in sorted order. Rip. Yeah, there's my full cache. Oh, look at that shit. Oh, 20 gigs a second of throughput. Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> um... What is this? I hate reading code to figure out formulas. Really annoying. X6 hash three. I w is this is this actually like nearly what I'm doing right now? No way. Um XX hash three math. Something. Where would I find the fucking description of what it does? Twenty nineteen. Okay. Hashing one byte at a time is slow, blah, blah, blah. Into four independent streams, each 32 bits wide and that 64 bits wide in this. Perfect, that's what I want. So what we're gonna take a look at is, I mean, I love the vectorized stuff. It's really cool, but it's not what I care about. So, if data length is greater than this, v1, v2, v3, v4. Get int data offset, offset plus equals four. Ah, so this takes 16 byte chunks, but that's acceptable because we actually have 16 byte chunks, kind of. Yeah, we do. <laughs> 13, so we're doing a rotate. Um, rotate left. So it looks like in parallel, it treats a bunch of 32-bit words, and then at the end, what does it do? It mixes them together by rotating them by different amounts and then adding them. So... Okay. Yeah, so there's four different states. I did not even know I had this editor. X64, states. So the states start with these uh, seeds and these primes. Add a chunk of bytes hash, get the current hash, and this will fold 256-bit state into a single 64-bit state. So it's relatively straightforward, so... Basically, we create one. This sets up the initial state. Um, we technically only need the first part, I guess. Well, arguably, we can take the latter parts. I don't know. This is, like, actually a decent amount of stuff. Streaming, it's probably pretty fast. But the, um, the resolution at the end is pretty bad. Uh... 
like the the cost of finalizing the hash like streaming it's fine i don't see any problems there but the finalization pass this is pretty expensive four instructions process single what does that do Process single, rotate left, multiply by a prime. Like, this is very expensive to finalize the hash. Um, huh. I mean, how good is this going to be? I want to take more bits from the top. So that... This is the only one that shuffles, shuffles in top bits. And it doesn't shuffle in too many top bits. I mean, it shuffles things around enough. XOR with that. XOR with that. XOR with that. I don't like how the top bits are not coming down into the hash. It's probably not a huge deal. The shift 17 is honestly pretty solid here for these addresses based on the size of our map. Um, I don't know, man. Um, hash together two sixty-four bits. Let's see if there's some something for this. What's this? Um, looked like this. Y yeah, that's no, I'm not fucking Shaw wanting this. Hash combine. That hashes two 64 bit values into one. If you only want a hash combine that hashes two 64 bit values into one, and you don't need a new and you don't need a new hash function for string, you can fit lift a tiny bit of code from city hash, something like this. Um add your favorite preprocessor template trigger, blah blah blah. So we have this hasher. So that just shifts by 47, merges it in with a multiplied version. Um, how is City Hash doing? City. City sixty four. Hmm. What else we got here? Moment mirror. Why is it so hard to like find good info on a hash like this? Maybe I'm just not Googling it very well. 
Zor shift, yup. Oh, integer hash function. Fast and good hash functions can be composed from fast computation, blah, 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 blah. Right. Kill walk, field multiple take. Okay. I think that's what I want. Integer hash function. That's what I want. Um, the re yeah. Really bad hash function. There are no collisions, blah, blah, blah. Um, shit. Do we just do our own analysis? Do we just make our own hash function? Is that what we're going to do? Um, it's interesting because this is exactly how I graph things. Because I've never made a, an integer hash function that's really good. Reaches avalanche. Dude, where are these fucking ads? Why are there so many fucking ads in this blog? Um... Bob Jenkins is a well-known authority on designing these. Okay. One at a time hash. The problem is my, uh, my values are... Um, how do I want to test this? I, I think, um, uh, what's a reasonable number that I can compute? Um, I can probably do like, I can probably do like 50 billion. Square root that. So I could do like 220, I could do like 200,000. And I could just brute force all combos and see how good my output is. Um, okay, let's just, let's just YOLO try some stuff. Um... Okay, vim source this. Okay, uh, for ii and zero to, uh, we'll go to 50,000 for now. For jj and zero to 50,000, and then we'll do u64. 
And then we'll do, uh, let me freaks is equal to a hash map new use standard collections hash map. This might be too, this hash map might be too slow. We'll see. Um, freaks entry IIJJ. Um, Well, we can actually do this. Frequencies is equal to um, vec. U8 should be sufficient. Um, just to keep it nice and packed. Well, no. We will have our hash, which will be a, a this will just be big. Um, We'll start with a meg. How many? Well, we need more than that. How many combos are there here? Fifty thousand squared. Uh, two point five gigs. So let's just do. Um. Let's do sixteen. Uh, let's do like sixty four gigs. So allocate sixty four gigs, and then our hash will be equal to um what we were doing here. And then we have the mask. Fuck. Ugh. Uh, e hash source paste. Okay. Hash is equal to, we have from and to. I, I, J, J. And then this will be uh, hash mod equals freaks.len. And then we'll do freaks. Asserts frequencies hash is zero. Frequencies hash plus equals one. I expect this to have collisions. Because we have such a tiny map here. Why is it so slow? No collisions yet, though. So obviously, as you reduce the size, oh, it probably hasn't allocated yet. Print elked. No, it allocates right away. Nice. Okay, so if we decrease the size of this, right, this should fail, right? Because we just don't have that big of a lookup. But in our case, how many different PCs do we have in our program? Um. Reasonably, we probably have uh, edges. I think we should, yeah, 50,000 edges is fair-ish. Um, this seems like pretty okay. And if I do what I was doing before, right, which was this, this is what I previously had. That fails very early, okay. So at least this tells me like approximately if it's ass. Um, let me just try this. See if we can speed it up. Okay, doesn't like that. Um, like Zorshift, Zorshift is really good, um, but typically you have to repeat Zorshift a couple times. So. You know what? I want to see the distribution. I want to go exactly to 50,000 times 50,000. I'll have collisions, but that's okay.
or constraining it to have a shit ton of collisions, which is acceptable, uh, is equal to uh, freaks hash as u size checked add one unwrap. Make sure we don't overflow the u8. And then I guess we can do um, const x, x and y. And we should be able to see. Now we can just play around with these sizes. OK. So none of them, yeah. None of them overflowed a bucket, which is great. This one will overflow a bucket, yeah. So basically, none of these are, are at least overflowing to um, Drillin 256. And then we can do uh, freaks.sort sort. Um, sort. And then print worst is freaks zero. Uh, freaks dot len minus one. The worst one has eight. That ain't bad, right? We basically are constrained to the side. Like, we have eight collisions if we have the exact same size. Like, that's pretty fucking good. Okay, and then let's model... What if there is some skew on that? Worst is 8. Let's put it really high up there. Uh, actually, we'll do JJ. We'll shift JJ by, like, 48. We'll put it way up in the top bits. And it's still doing fine, man. Like, that's really good. Does that mean if I... Increased by 8x, worse by th three collisions. It's fantastic. Worst is two. Um. It's honestly really good, man. Um, let me buckets is hash map new for uh, freak and freaks buckets dot entry freak dot or insert zero sixty-four plus equals one. Uh, we'll btree map this so it's readable. Okay, uh, for freak count in buckets, print five, ten freak count. So this is basically unused buckets, so things where we didn't get anything to fill in at all. Those high bits shouldn't work with a power of two modulo. These ones? So yeah, it looks like those collision rates aren't terrible. Basically, 370,000 of them, zero collisions. So a, a, basically a, a third. Um, and we can do this. And then we can do uh, eight dot six. Okay, so thirty six percent of the buckets are unused. Thirty seven percent of them had no collisions. Twenty percent had a collision. Which this is very constrained. This is basically um, like by having this be the, the exact same size is pretty brutal. But let's play around with this and see if we can find something that's nice. How does bits get shifted down with a shift to 17? I don't know. Oh, this is better. This is just this is just better. 
right? I guess there are some worse higher collisions. Yeah, 14% of them have no collisions. So that's worse. Let's try and let's add another shift of like, let's add a, a rotate right of like 57, of, of like, I don't know, like 47. Point is the modulo is doing the magic. I mean, not really. It's just masking off the bottom bits. Like... So if I don't shift that... Not if you've done a parse of two. Oh, I see what, I see what you're saying. Um... Yeah, you're you're totally right. Only twenty five percent of buckets are used, and then let's see this. Okay, does that XOR do anything? And I think it should, because it should introduce a little bit of entropy. Is it just always going to be this? Well, these rotates are ass. Let's get rid of those. Um. Shit. Well, that's terrible. So... I'm pretty sure if I did more rounds, it would be okay. Like, here. Because this is, this is or shift. So if I did four blank and zero dot dot... 32, right? This is ridiculous, but... What? Um. Do I want to XOR with those constants then? Uh, and we'll just invert this. Eh. We'll just change this to like a B and a 1 here. Why? Really? Can you just do a one? Well, the multiply is a lot better. Um... I mean, that might be about as good as we're going to get. Um, um, All 
Right, so what we want to do is we want to see what a distribution looks like when we actually have um, a real uh, crypto hash. Right. And then this will be our baseline. And then if we see a 36% distribution, then like, okay, then that's what we're going to fucking get. Um, hasher.input. Array length. Okay, we should be able to do this. Um, is hasher dot result, right? And then here we'll do a input. Um, I had two le bytes. JJ to Ellie Bytes. Wasn't that the example? What? Oh, it's that. I mean, obviously, we're just hacking right now. Um, this is literally what the example tells me to do. Dot digest? So their, their examples just are wrong now? Oh, latest version. Thank you. New and update. Okay. New. Update. Noise finalize. Bam. And what does that finalize into? Generic array. By the output size. You can slice that, I guess. We'll just get the bottom part. Or it doesn't really matter what part we get, but we'll slice the... These would be the bottom bits anyways. And then we'll do uh, U64 from LE bytes, right? Those are the lowest Indian bytes anyways. Well, it depends on how they display it, but uh, trying to unwrap. Use standard convert try into. Look at that, right? a fucking crypto hash and we're getting 367 right that's our distribution of a crypto hash um so and then we'll do like uh let ii is equal to ii times 1000 just to make sure it works with some of these we'll, we'll shift this by 48 or something. 36, 7. What's 64 squared? I'm thinking about trying all the shifts. 4096. That should be doable. So 36, 7. I mean, that's a real hash. 
And then our shit hash. Okay, ours is really weak when we shift that, but if we don't shift it, what happens? If we don't shift it, it's good. 36, eight, right? It looks pretty comparable. Um, then an 18, four, then a six, and then a one. 18, four, and then a six, and then a one. Like, right? <laughs> but it obviously has a weakness to this. So, I'm curious, if I do a rotate left, I've never done this, I think this will converge to um, not shifting in enough zeros, oh that's good, okay, do I need all of them? Can I just be a bit more aggressive and just do the 13? I mean, arguably yes. Uh, let's see if I need these. I think I, oh yeah. Uh, let's try it without these multiplies. What? What? <laughs> it's, a, it's a perfect hash. <laughs> it's, how? I guess when that shifted, yeah, if we don't have the shift, then obviously it's trash, right? So it's important to note that it does converge to trash. And I think I need to add entropy in, and that's what I'm effectively doing there. Wow, okay, that's bad then. Uh, hash 13, 17, 43. But the multiply works really well. That's good. And then this had some issues. Yes. That's really bad. We're gonna XOR this with II. JJ. Wow. Um. Hmm. And I'm going to try this XOR here. And then, let me see if I do more rounds of this. We'll just do it a ridiculous amount of rounds, just for funsies. I think we want to multiply by a prime. Let's grab these primes. Where are the primes at? Um... Well, this is too optimized. I guess it's hash three. Simple. I just want a simplified version of it. JavaScript. There we go, prime one. 
I like this. I like where this is going. We're going to multiply this by a prime. And then I think we want to shuffle in the prime some more. We'll, we'll probably end up just doing XX hash, I think, but maybe without the finalization step. It's hard to say what's going to happen here. But these are primes, which is good. I like primes. Yeah, look at that. That's much better. And can we do one of these? Wow, multiple rounds of this is critical. Um, so XX hash basically will um dude why can't i find like a good fucking implementation that isn't absolute ash let's talk about xx hash it's java get out Okay, why can't I just find something that fucking describes the XX hash three algorithm? Like, why can't I find someone that just literally mentions what the algorithm is? I don't care about implementations. Why is this so like? This is the cleanest one I've seen so far. We start with some state, which we'll start with. Actually, this was okay, wasn't it? Um, so, seed. Okay. Even zero is a valid seed. Okay, so we want to do... Uh, So I have these states, and then it goes through, does it in blocks. That's to fold it. I don't know, that's spendy, man. So, how many rounds of Zor shift do I need to do for this to get stable? That's pretty good right there, just two rounds of this bad boy. And that, that will shuffle in. I mean, that looks pretty good, right? That distribution. 36, 18, 6. Get rid of the shift 48. Looks fucking great. Have you seen the docs? Uh, XX hash spec. Hey, that's nice. I like this. That's good. I was trying to find it. Each get a value based on optional seed. It can be zero. And then, when the input is too small, the algorithm will not process any stripes. Oh, it'll not make use of parallel accumulators. Instead, it is uh, prime 64, 5. This. That's what I want. Right? Let me hash is equal to this. It then goes directly to step four. It adds the length of the input. I don't think that's necessary because it's a fixed size input. And then we consume the remaining. While it's greater than eight, read it little Indian. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you for this doc, by the way. Um, so, am I interpreting this correctly? If it is less than that, we just start with the accumulator as prime 90, uh, as this prime, right? So we're using that prime. We start with that. Make sure that this knows it's a U64. Um, if it's less than that, it's just seed plus that. Seed optionally can be zero. Proceeds directly to four. We add the input length. Um, adding the length, so there's final mixing. The length is constant, so there's no reason to add that. 
and then we consume. While the remaining length is greater than or equal to 8, then we take the accumulator. Let's try it. Let mute um, or hash xor equals round 0 and then lane. And lane is what we just read. So this will be ii. So we need to. Final mix, avalanche. Oh, that's easy. That's a relative. Ah, eh, it's not terrible. Um, what's round? Okay. Um, I see. So the round. I'm guessing that's rotate. Yeah, that's rotate left. It's not arithmetic shift left. That would make no sense. Um, one second. What my friend see is coming over? Nine, okay. One second, I gotta order some food. I kind of forgot to eat today. Do, do, do. Um, Thai food? Thai food sounds good. Oh, uh, do, 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 do. Bank. Done. Okay. What else do I want? I'm so fucking hungry. I kind of forgot I was hungry. Double up on those. Doop. Doop, doop, doop. Okay. You can now do priority deliveries? The fuck is that shit? God damn, ordering food's so fucking expensive. Oh well. Alright. So... I'm guessing it goes through these rounds. Oh, it only does round zero. Round zero and then lane. So we do, in this case, it's just always round zero, right? That's constant. So we have to implement round zero. And this is just the val u64, yield to u64. And we'll take the, make this mute, val plus equals um, oh. Well, we can do uh, round u64 mute round so what does this collapse into 
That'll be zero. So we multiply, yeah, let's just collapse this shit. So we'll take the hash, which is the lane. No, the lane is the value. So we take the hash and we XOR it with, and we're only using lane at this point. So then lane, we do some shuffling on lane. And to do that, um, do, 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 do. Where was it? That's for 32, 64, round. Oh, here it is. So we want to take the value, ii, multiply it by prime 64, 2. Okay. Hash. Oh, this is, um, let mute ack is equal to this. So... We have the, the base hash thing that we're working with. Multiply that by that prime. Ack is equal to ack.rotate left by 31. And then ack times equals uh, the first prime. Okay. Right, so this is basically doing the round. We're taking the lane, the ii, we multiply it by prime two, we rotate it to the left by 31, and then we multiply it by prime one. And then we'll go to round. Consume remaining input. So we go directly to this step. And now we want to XOR. Uh, hash XOR equals, and this is a, uh, we'll just call this temp. And the hash XOR equals temp. And then we do hash is equal to hash dot rotate left by 27 multiplied by prime 64 one, which is this. Yeah, prime 64, one is 87, and we can make these constants. We'll, we'll do that when we kind of see how this does. Um, and then hash plus equals. So hash is equal to the hash rotate left by 27 multiplied by that. And then we're going to take the hash and we're going to add it to the prime 64, four. Okay, and then we're just consuming. So XOR with the round, rotate it left by 27, multiply it by prime one, which is this one, and then we multiply it, or we add prime four, and then we continue, so we do this again. And none of the rounds changed here. So then in this case, we just have JJ, merge it in. Honestly, let's see how that's doing just right now. That's already looking good. And then the avalanche will probably be useful if we have, um, kind of depends on the positions of these. Make sure all the input bits have had, uh, I had a chance to impact the output digest. And then we're just XORing and multiplying by primes. So how expensive is this? Because I feel like the thing that I had working before was probably acceptable. this. I'm just going to paste this so I don't lose it. Uh, 
Like, that looks pretty good. So, we multiply that by that. I like how that XORs the prime first. I feel like that's a better way to do it. But this is pretty cheap. And if we do one round of that, then it falls apart. But basically, this is our avalanche, right? The final part's our avalanche. So we basically multiply by a prime avalanche, multiply by another prime avalanche. Um, and let's just use their primes, because we can just get them from here. Multiply that. And as long as this is a different prime, I feel like this is probably acceptable. Okay. So then we're going to... Um, assert... Frequencies... Uh, buckets... 0 divided by, as f64, divided by x times y. Oh, buckets 1. Buckets. Um, is greater than or equal to 0.35. All right. Uh, boop, 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 boop. So assert that that bucket is greater than or equal to 35. So if we change this to a 1 uh, and this to a 1. No entry found for key. Yeah, that didn't even have an entry in the one, the one place. Okay. So then what I'll do is... For champed in 0 to uh, 1024 is how many bits? 10 bits? 256, 512, yeah, 1024. So we can go to 54. And we'll do this. Okay, frequencies. And then we will have this. We don't need this shit. Um. Let ii is equal to ii shift shamped. So we're going to try to see how resilient it is to different shift amounts. Okay, check that. that. Then we sort, which we don't need to anymore. Um, nice. Um... Let's say uh, B1 is equal to this. Assert B1 this. Uh, print 8.6 B1. We can pr print the shift amount. So this will print those buckets, right? And if we were to change one of these to a 1, we'll see if there's some more variance. Honestly, that looks okay. And then this one falls apart at 38 as a shift amount for some reason. Huh. I can do two rounds of this. It doesn't matter too much. It's relatively cheap. And those are looking fine. Um, for champ two in zero to fifty four. And then we'll do, uh, JJ is JJ champ two. So we're going to try all the different places that these can be in relation to each other. Nice. That's what I like to see. Good. Champ two. Um. 
fellow C program. Oh, I'm doing some rust here. <laughs> but I also I also program in C. Um wow. So we have a situation where it falls apart. Awesome. Awesome. Let's update these. Go to 32 and just see what happens. We wouldn't want to do this because it'd be too slow. It's too slow. Um, let's just go to 256. Okay, and then we'll go back to 2. And hopefully this will also have a failure. Yes, it does. And now we can go to, since we're doing 256, that's 8 bits. Uh, 64 minus 8 is 56. Okay, so let's maybe use their avalanche mechanism. XOR equals accumulator shift by 33. So this is how they avalanche. Um, hash multiply equals prime 64 to Grab all these. We're, we're probably just going to end up using XX hash, but you know. Okay. Bink, 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 bink. Static const u64 const g. I just don't like how many multiplies happen here. Well, I guess this avalanche is only done once in there, so we should probably use their aval. We should probably just use xx hash. So. Um, first we'll avalanche this just for funsies. XOR with hash shift that. Multiply this by this. Hash XOR equals hash shift 29. Multiply it by prime 3. And then XOR equals by 32. Um... XOR, that shift 33, multiply by this, hash shift 29, multiply by 3, XOR shift 32. Okay. Nice. So, um, now... If we do xx hash, we can do this thing where we do the temp that we did before. I'm going to rewrite it because now we have the constants. So the hash starts out as um, if it's less than 32 bytes, it just starts out like this, right? So there's our hash. It starts like that. There's a seed, but it's optional. Then we do the round. Let's mute temp is equal to ii plus, oh, that's accumulator n, which is zero. We're going to take lane n, and we're going to do ii times prime 64 2. And then temp is temp dot rotate left by 31. And then temp multiply equals uh, prime 64, 1. Right. So we take lane n, we multiply it by prime 64, 2. We rotate it left by 31 in place. And then we multiply the result of that. Um, yeah, because we're adding that together. Now ack n has been overwritten. Uh, that's basically a, a seed kind of. So lane n, multiply by that, rotate left by 31, and then multiply that, and equals, multiply equals, uh, prime 64, 1. Okay. So we start off with that. We then, once we do that round, 
we then hash XOR equals um, the round. And then we do hash is equal to hash rotates left by 27 multiply by prime 64 1. And then hash is equal to the hash dot, uh, it's just the hash plus equals prime 64 4. So XOR equals with the round, then rotate it left and multiply it by this, and then add prime 64 4, and that's it. So that does, right, that's basically, we start off, we do that, we do it another round, this is now JJ, and then we finalize the hash, right? And yeah, we just fall through, and then we avalanche, which is XOR 33, multiplied by the prime 2, XOR shift 29, multiplied by prime 3, XOR by 32, okay. Yeah, and everything looks good here. In fact, can we even say it's greater than or equal to 36? Yeah, we can. Ah. <sighs> And yeah, that's trying all the different shifts, which is pretty solid here. Um, and then if we just update this bucket, if we 32x the bucket, yeah, look at that. That's still a decent collision rate. Um, I guess we probably want like 256x. Um. Hmm. Well, X, Y, in this case, um, if I have like 50,000 blocks or 50,000 coverage, 256 times that, yeah, we can, we can probably get by with this. I don't know, unless I can find a way to make it not have collisions, but I don't know if I can. Bright Rage, thank you so much for the two gifted subs. Hell yeah. Thank you for that. Playing around with some hashes. Hmm. I don't know, man. I'm like concerned about the perf of this. Wilbo with the Twitch Prime, holy shit. Got a party going on now. Fuck. I mean, our previous hash was terrible, so that's good. This, this would be an update. Um. Is the hash collision equals miss coverage thing worth it? Is it really so slow to use a full or safe hash map? It probably isn't, honestly. Like, it's probably more expensive to compute a correct hash than to deal with collisions, right? Like, we could probably make a much shittier hash and then handle collisions. <sighs> um, I 
I don't know if I can do it atomically though. How do I do that? So what I do is I generate my shit hash. And with my shit hash, I would then look that up and have a coverage map. Now that would increase the size of my coverage map by a factor of 128, which kind of sucks, but collisions won't matter as much. I don't, yeah, I think I don't want to have collisions. I think you're right. Um, and then this hash can be shit. Uh, and then the hash map would contain all of the components that are used. Um, and then I'd have to figure out what I want that to be. So to and from. I, so I think I could do a hash map with two U64s. For non-compare coverage, I just have the to and from. For compare coverage, I would have the two, and then I intentionally have a collision on the next one, which would be the, like, number of bits that match or whatever. Because um, I can collapse that down into a pop count or into a 256. I'm pretty sure two U64 should be enough. It gets me perfect two from edges. And then when I have, um, gives me perfect two and from edges. And then I get f for compare coverage or for different types of coverage, I start doing some lossy stuff, but for other stuff, I need to go lossy anyways. So, uh, I'm going to turn on the light for the, the delivery person. Be right back. Like, we're getting to the point that I don't really care about the performance as much anymore because we're, we're extra, this is starting to become a more sophisticated fuzzer where the perf doesn't matter nearly as much. Um, the smart stuff really offsets it. Yeah, absolutely. If we're making a smart fuzzer, we need to have perfect coverage, in my opinion. So, can I do it with two U64s? Yes. I'm pretty sure everything I need to do can be done with two U64s. Um, I could have the compare coverage use the bitmap and be lossy. Because I don't think that stuff matters as much, to be correct. But... So what's that going to look like? We're going to look up something in the bitmap, and then we're going to compute a hash... And um,
Do we just have a magic value for the first U64 that indicates that the entry is being filled in? Basically, we're we're gonna have we're gonna have an array of tuples, right? Uh, the cov map will be a vector of uh, U64 U64s, right? For big. And um. What I'll probably have this be, well, these will be atomic U64s. I might have a one magic number, and I think that's acceptable because a 64-bit magic number is, is fine. So I have literally a random number, and I think the logic will basically be um, generator shit hash, and then we say if um, compare, we'll, we'll do like cov map shit hash. Uh, loop coverage map shit hash dot um, store we'll probably initially fill it with something uh, compare what is it compare and swap compare and swap we will have the current value which uh, we'll expect to be a magic number like That'll basically be not present. And then we'll swap in another match. Uh, we're going to have two magic numbers. So uh, compare and swap this. So if it is an empty entry in the coverage map, then swap in the pending entry, ordering sequentially consistent. And then in this situation, we own the entry, fill it in. Otherwise, um, um, we don't control the entry. So in this situation, we just need to fill in first, and this will be on dot zero, and then we'll uh, fill in uh, one store, you know, our value, and we'll make sure that we don't store until uh, we store the, the first one last, right? The first one's a signaling one as well. So we'll fill that in. Unless I just want to eat another U64 and not have magic numbers, and then just have a lock on the entry. But that basically increases my memory usage by like 50%. Which isn't that big of a deal, because now we can use a smaller coverage map because collisions will be handled. Um, so fill in the entry. Otherwise, in this situation, so in that compare and swap, we swapped in the value. So we swapped. This is, indicates that the entry is empty. This indicates that the entry is currently being filled in. This one overwrites it. And if the value is not one of these values, well, we know it's not empty. Um, so at this point, it is impossible for it to be empty. So what we'll do is while covmap shit hash dot zero dot load um, ordering sequentially consistent is equal to this. Right? Um, we lost the race. This will be uh, wait for the entry to be filled in, right? So while it is being filled in, just spin. And then if, and then at this point, uh, compare um, our tuple to theirs. Uh, if match. Right, and then this uh, generates new cov events, right? And then compare our tuple to theirs. If it matches, then um, no new cov uh, break. And then in this situation, we'll just do um, shit hash plus equals one, right? I think that is has no flaws, I except for two magic signaling numbers, which we could potentially eliminate by changing the format, but we'd need another U64 in here. It's not like we can put a U8 in here because then it'd be unaligned. So uh, check if it's empty. If it's empty, 
then replace it with this atomically, and then tell us, hey, just letting you know, you just filled in an empty entry, you own it, fill it in. Otherwise, it it's impossible that it's empty, because someone atomically filled it in. So then wait for it to no longer be in the state. So while it is in the filling in state, basically while this code is executing in the thread that one, once this executes, it's no longer this magic number. This will generate a new coverage event because it's stored one, and then this drops through. Um, and no new coverage, break. Uh, basically, at this point, we are comparing ourselves to something that has the same hash, and we do a perfect comparison of the two U64s. If they match, then it's already recorded, break out. Otherwise, update the shit hash, go to the next entry. And you can do, uh, you know, whatever seeking method you want to use. You can use your prime here if you want. Uh, it doesn't really matter. So... Um... How many entries in will I have in my coverage database? Let's see. Probably... Probably under, like... I don't think I'll really ever have a situation where I go over 10 million. 10 million is pretty high, even when I'm doing crazy introspection. And 10 million times, let's say, um, 24 bytes. So assuming that I get rid of this signaling one... Uh, that's only 240 megs. Now, adding, by not using magic numbers, so using these magic numbers means that we could have some weird shit happen if one of these happens to be a, a, a an instruction address. It's never gonna fucking happen. Like, I'm never gonna have a program where this is a valid instruction because I can't, I actually currently can't emulate anything that uses a non-canonical address because I don't make a fake uh, memory address space. So, I feel like it's not worth losing the cache locality of adding another U64 here that's just here to indicate the validity of an entry. I think it's acceptable to use a magic value here. The odds that you ever generate this is basically zero. Especially in, in uh, Risk Five, where these aren't even aligned instructions. It's just, it'll never fucking happen. Thoughts? So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and make a shit hash. And our shit hash is gonna take a little bit from this. I think we'll probably, like, maybe bypass the finalizing stage. Maybe get rid of adding uh, some more of these primes. Something like this. Start out with that, multiply this, rotate it left, multiply it by this. Like, you know, we can just abuse it a little bit. Um. Okay. Oh, 36. Yeah, let's say 35. This doesn't need to be that great anymore. Honestly, we can just say, like, is it greater than 30? It's acceptable. Hey, Russell Lang, how are you doing today? Okay, what can we get rid of? I bet we can get rid of that. No, we can't. Really? I'm kind of surprised. No entry found for key. Yeah, that's bad. I mean, we can handle collision, so it might not be too bad anymore. I might do this. I think, I think our, uh, our hash is acceptable. 1743 XOR the next thing in use a different prime for it you know 
This is JJ. All right, what's this looking like? Oh, perfect. Um. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we have a problem here, but let's see if we can do a 4 blit and 0 dot 2. Wow. Um... I guess I actually probably want to do this. Freaks dot. Um. Some. I just want to print the average frequency. Right. As F sixty four, um, yeah, I don't think I can sum into that, so we'll do a, um, I'll just change it to U sixty four. I don't care right now. Uh, iter. Average frequency is always going to be... Wait. I want to, um... Uh, filter... Where x is greater than zero. Counts. This is the average quantity in a bucket. Right? Yeah, some are bad. So this is saying like 256 of them hit the same bucket. Not not good. Um Can we multiply equals this? And then we'll use a prime 3 here. Whoa. Rotate left thirty three. A. Okay. Assert AF is less than two. Ooh. Yeah, 
You know what? 2.03 is maybe okay. Let's go to 4. Alright. Um... Shit. And if I XOR these, is this a problem? If I do all XORs? Yeah, just... Um... Try this. Mm. Hmm. So these ones worked, right? They worked if we did it too, I think. The rotate was big, wasn't it? Yeah, rotate was huge. Let me try a different rotate. Wow. That 33 is a good one. Um... I mean, what if I just XOR the two fucking things and call it a day? Like, what if I literally just do I I XOR JJ? Like, yeah, it's going to have 256 in some slots. But how often is that actually going to happen? Like, I think if that's 1 to x, it won't have, um, times prime 64, 1. Like, 2's not terrible. Let's go to 100. Actually, 10. Mm, 20? There's going to be a pattern. Yeah, it's going to ramp here. Yeah. Um... Uh, XOR equals hash at rotate. Here's their avalanche stage. Let's see if we can steal their avalanche. And just avalanche the shit in. We'll add in JJ times prime 64 2. 29 in there. Hmm. Hash times equals prime 64 2. And then in this XOR phase, where we XOR in the hash shift 29, we'll also XOR in the JJ times prime 64 1. And then we'll do a 3. And then we'll do a shift 32. Fuck. Maybe I just add in JJ at this phase. If 
I just do I I? Okay. Then we multiply that by the prime. Then we add in JJ. Then we cycle that in. Multiply by a new prime. Let's see if we can just do this. No. Thoughts? This is pretty damn cheap. <laughs> like, that's pretty cheap. <laughs> we can maybe do this. Unless it falls apart with larger numbers, but like... I'm okay with this. Across the board, less than two, right? It's a tiny collision rate. Not even worried about it. Yeah, it's fine. They're all less than two. It falls bird if you want to use the high bits. Oh, if you want, yeah, if you want the top part of the hash. Yeah. Yeah, what if I do this? I don't know, it looks pretty solid. Like, that's great, man. Basically, all we're doing is we're just shuffling in the II. So II, we kinda, we make sure there's a little bit of presence of II in both the top and bottom parts of this. Multiply by a prime to get some shit in here, add in JJ. Once again, shuffle in, make sure it's kind of mirrored on both the top and the bottom sides. Shuffle it in more and then shuffle in like this honestly is actually pretty solid like That's that Even when we're using some of the higher bits it seems to be fine Like you want to try you want to try a uh, hash shift equals 32 We'll only look at the high bits. Yeah, it's still doing good up there, too. Like, 48, only take the very top ones. A little bit worse up there, but still under two. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, I'm okay with that. That's really good, dude. 56, we need more than that, don't we? I, uh, yeah, we need, like... Probably 48 or what, whatever, how big our hash is. But yeah, that looks good. Like, it's good! <laughs> That's fantastic! <laughs> Super cheap. It's actually cheaper than what we're already doing, I think. Um... Um, the only thing that could be better is if I had separate dependencies and I didn't chain these. And I had II and JJ calculate separately. Let me see if I can do this. Hash 2. Do this shit to hash 2. Um, I don't think this is identical, but it might still be acceptable. No. There's probably a way that I can do it, but you know what? I'm happy with this. We're, we're there. From all that, I've figured that to, in order to make a hash, you do random operations to tell the stats that you're good. Yeah. Yeah, it looks good to me. Okay, let's try and go to 512 now. And we'll keep this at, uh, just at full size. 
So now we have like Is that? Oh, um Is that really all 512? Oh shit. Uh get rid of the print. Yeah, now we're over shifting things. That's fine. Honestly, let's just go to 64. Let's just Oh, some of these are going to get fucked. Um Let's just shift by like 50. Give us a couple more bits of space. And then let's just do uh let I I I mean that's like Let I I is I I plus I mean we're already like effectively trying this. Yeah, we're already trying these things. Effectively with the shifts. Yeah, it looks fine. This is acceptable. I think we're good. <laughs> we did we did it. Woo. Um uh coverage map table so we'll have an atomic u64 atomic u64 okay um And then we'll have some constants, const um, coverage entry empty. This will be a U64. Indicates that coverage entry is empty. We can honestly just put them next to each other. Is uh currently being populated. Okay. Um, coverage table pub these. This will be a vector of atomic. Uh, ba, 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 ba. We're gonna have to do this syntax. Dot uh, zero to this. Dot map atomic U sixty four new coverage entry empty. Atomic U64 new zero, because that one's not used for signaling. Dot collect. And then obviously we'll need to pull this in from emulator. And eventually this file, this this big file right here, eventually this will get moved into something and then you'll use these routines. We're just we're kind of doing template stuff in main, and then we're going to move it down in the stack, and then we'll build a main that uses those things. So, okay. That's on emu. That's emu. This is... Um, Um, we'll just keep that cut around. That's basically the like coverage is new. What's this from? Oh, that was in here. Okay. Delete this. Uh, 
Delete, delete, delete. Delete. I just kind of care about that a little bit. That's it. Oh, you know what? The, um... Nah, we will want to do it in the JIT. Okay. Coverage event. Compare coverage. Yoinks that. Eight forty four. Yeah, that goes away. That goes away. Check for a timeout, update the path hash, and then we do all our shit here. Currently we should be able to comment that out, and this should get us very close to building. Um two four oh five. Okay, we got some uh, curly boys. Uh, coverage event. It'll be this. Yeah. Okay, Atomic U64, not defined here. Yep. Atomic U64. Hey. Okay. Obviously, it doesn't work yet. Um, so now, all we have to do is change our coverage event in the non-JIT version here. And what we'll do is um, let cov is equal to corpus dot coverage table. Uh, we'll call it the CT. Got access to the coverage table. And then we'll do, uh, let's get that hash. The world's best fucking hash. Compute the hash. The hash will start out as um, self.state. Oh, from and to. Okay. So I'll have a from and a to. Make sure this is a U64. So from, to. Then we'll do a coverage table at hash.0 compare and swap the pending and whatever. Coverage entry. This swap in a pending. That'll return true. Um, uh, compare and swap. I think it returns true. Atomic I32. Oh, it returns the old one. Okay, we can do that. Um, if that is equal to, if it was empty, then the swap occurred, right? So swap in an empty for a pending. If it's equal to empty, we own the entry, so we fill it in. And all we're going to do is in the coverage table for hash. Oh, yeah, and let hash is equal to hash as u size mod... Uh, ct.len right uh, bounds the hash to the coverage table and here and we might want to ensure that it's uh, a power of two and everything so here we'll just store the two and the from and at that point cover just happened um, 
coverage. Notify code coverage. All right, so we're gonna say, notify code coverage, and notify code coverage will, I mean, now we kind of have another table. Um, well, this one can hold more information. So we'll stick with this for now. This is going to be a fast one. And then the other one can hold more arbitrary information in it. Um, and it doesn't have this wonky behavior of magic values and stuff. Otherwise, we lost the race. Wait for the coverage table. Well, ct hash dot zero dot load is equal to, um, well, this is equal to pending, right? Um, then we'll say if ct hash um, is equal to, I think equality is defined where I can do this. Creating those is effectively free. And let me see if I can do this. So break. Um, coverage already uh, recorded. And then uh, go to the next. I'll just do let hash mod equals ct.len. Um, bounds the hash to the table, convert hash to a u size. So convert the hash to a u size, bound it to the table. Then here, I think I can do equality on u atomics. So if what is there, so it's no longer pending, if what is there is identical to the to and from, uh, it's actually from and then to. Then, coverage is already recorded break. Otherwise, we go to the next hash. So we update the hash um, is equal to, well, it's not going to overflow a U size. Um, go to the next entry. And then, so this will break out, basically, if there's already a match. And then, compute the hash. Update the coverage bitmap. Update that shit. That's just gone. Honestly, this might even be easier than what we had before. Uh, no atomics. Uh, atomic. Atomic U64 ordering. Oops. Um, okay, there's no equality. No big deal. Um, if zero dot load ordering sequentially consistent, uh, at this point we can go relaxed. If this is equal to from and ct hash zero load ordering relaxed is two. So if zero is from and one is two, we already recorded this. Uh, make this mute. There it is. And yeah, we're not using atomic U64 in here anymore. We're just using ordering because it's created elsewhere. Um, we use two and three. Size of val not being used in emulator. Jit cache and calic BP not being used. Underscore. Calic BP. Calic BP. 
No warnings, no errors. No coverage is being generated. Okay, um... Filled. And then that stops. Oh, I have to um, update the uh, from things. Uh, Self.state.cov from is equal to from. Cov2 is equal to 2. And we notify. I should just pass those as args now because we're rewriting this stuff. But this should work now, and we should. There's our bug. Fantastic. Okay, bear back. I gotta check if the food is here. Okay, um, so that's pretty good, um, so now I'll just record uh, from and to here, notify code coverage, this will just have a from to, to what the fuck okay um from to that's our key. This should work. Well, not here yet. Um, Self.state.cov from self.state.cov to. And now we gotta make our JIT work. But there's that. Code coverage. And then coverage should. Notify A, compare coverage. Okay, notify code coverage. Okay, so now we just have to write this in C. Yeah, generate this hash. So we just gotta rewrite all of this in C. Uh, it's this one. Okay. Yeah. 
here. So what I want to do is check for a timeout. Well, now we're outputting C. Um, so we're going to do program plus equals. I'm guessing we're going to need format strings here. Okay. Dot, dot, dot. Bink. Okay. So, if self.state.insert is exact, is that what we had before? I should update that, I think, when I call into the JIT. When I run the JIT, yep, I update that. Okay. So if that is greater than the timeout, then we want to exit with a timeout. Timeout. Re-enter PC. Update the path hash. Here we're gonna do uh, a rattle sixty four of the path hash seven and here we pass in the two. Self. So this is just state path hash. Same with this. State instance exact state timeout. State path hash. Um constant sixty four T is equal to those ULL. Uh, the coverage table we already have, and let's make sure uh, state. So we have the cov bitmap. This is not the cov bitmap anymore. This is the cov table. Cov table. Of table, and this is a cov table. The pointer is constant. It points to um, the pointer itself does not change, and it points to u sixty fours, but I actually want it to point to. Um, how would I have that be a fucking array? How do we do a pointer to array? Do I not know how? Do to do, do. Why don't I know how to do a pointer to an array? Um, is it you and sixty four T cov table? It's this all right. It's an up. Because I don't want an array of pointers.
Uh... Yeah, this is correct. Okay. So then... We have these constants. We're going to make this hash. Uh, U in 64T hash is equal to the from. To. That's how we notify code coverage from and to PC cov source. Uh, from is from, to is to, and then PC is PC dot zero. Okay, now we need more curly cues. Once the Rust compiles, we'll worry about getting the C to compile. To, from, just in case those expand in weird ways, I'm putting those in parens. Same with that one. Those should be fine. Okay, this will build and then the compiled output won't work. Well, we need to enable the JIT. All right, well, a little side tangent there. Okay, yeah. Of course. Um, let's... Here. So... Size T, hash, size T, hash, mod equal the, we're going to end equal the, um, actually, this is a constant, so mod equal is going to be fine here, uh, cov table len, uh, cov table len is equal to, Corpus dot coverage table dot len. And then we'll ULL that. Okay. Coverage uh, entry empty. Okay. So none of these things are going to exist. We need to do a uh, sync, compare, and swap. And we can actually do, uh, eh, we'll, we'll keep it. So we'll do, um, this is going to be a, a CT hash zero. Uh, auto CT is equal to state coverage table, uh, cup table. So if, so we're going to do a sync val compare and swap. Redefinition of that. Yep. Uh, CT. Redefinition of CT. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just scope this whole thing out. Okay. Redefinition of hash. Oh, yep, you can't do that. 
Well, C doesn't care about indexes like that. So CT hash, sync val compare and swap. We should give a pointer to the value, uh, the thing to replace it with, and that, and then we'll do uh, I think we'll just do this. Empty, pending. Okay. Empty. Fuck. Empty is equal to this. Um. Pending is equal to coverage entry pending. Obviously, we haven't done everything in here yet. This will be if it's equal to empty. So this will return the old value. Then we will do a um, is equal to two. This is equal to from and Do I need to do a memory barrier here? I mean, that's, it's not gonna be smart enough to know that, is it? Releases a lock, yeah, yeah. <sighs> How do I make sure these don't get reordered? Okay, I can do this. Are these the CXX things? Store. N. From. Okay, we need some parens on shit. Um, bink, bink, else, just comment this shit out for now. Just want to see how close this is. Loop uh, four. Um. These should be references. And then these literals are too large. Yes, they are. ULL. The twos and froms. Okay. Um, oh yeah, that gets stuck. Because then it hits the coverage again. Perfect. 
So then we'll do atomic load n, which returns the type reference to ct hash zero. Um, I kind of expected some of these things to not be defined here. Uh, while this is not equal, or while this is equal to pending Then, if uh, we'll just do unit 64t um, a is equal to ct hash 0 of a and b, if a is from and b is to. Coverage was already recorded. Break. Otherwise, go to the next hash. Shit. This might be it. Not quite. Compare coverage. There we go. While that value is equal to pending, and then this one we store from last. Two for your arguments for call, yes. Bam. No. No. Ooh, return. Covered source from to ULL. Um, hmm. The biggest thing I'm concerned about is that array syntax. But sync val compare and swap. Swap in empty with pending. Let's make sure I got that right. Compare value, exchange value, and then it returns the initial value. If it's empty, fill in the to and the from return. If we lost the race while loading the value is equal to pending spin. Oh. Uh, A is zero, B is one. The zeroth is the from, B is two. Would that explain it though? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Oh, uh, there's the crash. Nice. Nice. And what if I did two here? Will this complain to me? Will the compiler say like, yo dog, that's out of bounds of the array? Mmm, no. But, I'm guessing this is working. Otherwise it would have crashed pretty hard. If it, if it was an array of pointers, it would have crashed very hard by now. So now, code coverage is now, uh, there's no collisions in the code coverage. So from to generate that hash, update the path hash. Um, compare coverage. Compare coverage feeds into the existing uh, coverage. 
and I don't know if this one does too. Compare coverage, calls, coverage event with compare coverage. All right, I think my food's here. Okay, well, I'm gonna call it here. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll, uh, we'll get back to this pretty soon, but uh, we'll try and get this running on a real target. We were very likely missing a lot of coverage feedback because of that lossiness. See y'all around.